What I Found by Anonymous Sitting on the western side of the Missouri River is Omaha, Nebraska, a large metropolis that has been Nebraska's largest city for many years. It has witnessed many historical events throughout its almost 170 years. Like many cities, Omaha had many ethnic neighborhoods where new immigrants settled down with people of their kind. A section of town known for its meatpacking plants appropriately named South Omaha became the home of many Eastern Europeans, Poles, Czechs, Germans, Lithuanians, Slavics, Croatians, and more all resided here. However, many of these slaughterhouses closed as years passed and the area changed forever. A few remain, but the days of massive feedlots are gone. Growing up here, I was always told stories about South Omaha and its past. Many old buildings remained to act as silent monuments to the old days and often mesmerized me in my youth. I wanted to see these old buildings. Some old slaughterhouses, factories, even old breweries that Omaha was once famous for. One building stood out to me though. One of the old slaughterhouses lay close to the train tracks that cut South Omaha in half. This building was massive, with almost five stories. It was very long, about three complete football fields wide. Built of brick and steel, this old building was a testament to the people of this city. However, I heard it would soon be demolished and was instantly saddened by the news. Hearing about urban exploration over the internet always piqued my interest, but I was always too nervous about trespassing. Since this building was set to be demolished, I decided to go and see it before it became a parking lot. I set out of my truck on a fantastic fall evening to see this behemoth of a building. I brought my heavy LED mag light and dressed in light hiking gear to avoid looking conspicuous. The slaughterhouse lay near the train tracks in a more deserted area of South Omaha. Around it were other buildings adorned with the same red and white brick that this building also wore. Many tall grasses and empty lots surrounded the building, all the while a chain link fence surrounded the entire complex that was the slaughterhouse. I was prepared for this and parked some distance away on a side street near a garage. Walking towards the building, I became aware of its immense size. It indeed was magnificent and occupied a mammoth amount of space. The fence did not feature a barbed wire top so that I could climb over. The minute I stepped onto the ground after the fence, I felt a strange sensation from inside me. Nervousness? Fright? I guess both if I had to really give a guess. Whatever it was, it remained with me as I proceeded on. I approached a door with a window on the side of the building. Whatever logo or name had been affixed to it before had long worn off and the glass was covered in dirt and grime. I tried the handle and it would not budge. I felt the door loose and figured it could probably be opened with some force. I eventually got it open after bashing my shoulder into it, accidentally breaking the lock. Oh well, I thought, it was going to be torn down anyway. I entered the slaughterhouse and flicked on my flashlight. As I stepped into the pitch blackness, I was greeted with a large open room that featured lots of decrepit machinery undoubtedly used for meat processing. The walls and floor were tile, easy cleaning, shouldn't be too long to do that. Long conveyor belts were shaking and snaking through the room strewn with dust and cobwebs control stations, desk, and more surrounded me. None of this, though, looked like it had been touched for many years. I made my way through the mess of machinery and dust until I reached a pair of double doors. I pushed them open slightly into another large room. But as I did, something, something changed. It suddenly became frigidly cold, which was odd because it was only 65 degrees out. So sure, it wasn't like hot, but it wasn't cold either and there was no wind at all. It felt like winter had come into this room alone. I shivered but pressed on. The next room was what I presumed to be the killing floor. It had a significant main pathway for the cattle to move through and then conveyor belts to carry them to the next station to be dressed. Now, 
Living near the stockyards all my life, I have become used to the smells that emanate from this part of town. The smell that hit me as I browsed this room was on a different level though. It was not a familiar smell of cow poop or burnt meat, but of death, decay, and disease. It was otherworldly. I have read and heard about rotting smell lending itself to wendigos, skinwalkers, and the like, so I was on edge. I tried to convince myself that it was just a dead animal or something more reasonable. I continued to walk through the next room with an absolutely uneasy feeling. Suddenly, a sound like no other shook the room with great ferocity. It was the bellow of a bull. It did not sound normal, though. It sounded like a cry. This was incredibly loud, shrieking like it was about to charge. I looked around quickly to find the scream source, but I couldn't find a damn thing. I continued to move through the room, finally reaching the other end. Bright, shiny tile lined this side of the room, with more conveyor belts, large plastic bins on wheels. As I closed in on these bins, I was in a state of absolute shock. These bins were full of bones. They were massive bones, obviously from cows. How could they still be here? This place has been out of operation for close to 40 years. The bones were still bloody and smelled fresh. I was about to start freaking out at this point, honestly. I looked down and saw the floor was covered in blood from these bins. I quickly stepped back and nearly slipped on the tile. As I did this, I noticed a light from one of the doors near my end. Two red eyes appeared in the dark, and I leaned closer to see what it was. Suddenly, another loud bellow rang through the room, and those eyes got closer. I could hear hooves on the tile floor. I sprinted from my spot, bolted through the door, and got to the other side of the room. Once through the door, I ran down a hall lined with shiny tile. I followed this hallway, hoping to find my way out. I expected the bull to find me, or maybe just leave me alone entirely, but I was still determined. I reached the end of the hallway and approached the doorway with rubber flaps across it like you would see at a butcher shop. I pressed through and turned to the right but stopped dead. A faint red light bulb exposed a workstation with multiple men cleaning a cow. Th they, they wore long white smocks, helmets, goggles, and rubber boots. One was spraying down the cow, the other was cutting a part off, and the last was moving some bones to a bin. I couldn't believe my eyes. How is this possible? Did some meat packing still take place? That couldn't be possible. There's no way. As I stepped more into the room, I heard something unusual. They weren't speaking English. It sounded almost uh, Eastern European, maybe Polish. It had to be. I remember my grandparents speaking Polish to me occasionally. With my grandfather being full-blooded Polish, I was still in awe what I was seeing. I needed to get by these guys to leave, so I started to move past them. I don't know how, but they heard me, and all turned to look. Everyone stopped what they were doing. Three bespeckled men stared at me with only the dim red light exposing them. I froze in my tracks and knew I was trespassing. One man shouted something in Polish to me and began moving my way. The others followed. I fled to the other door and sprinted as fast as possible down the hallway. I heard their footsteps behind me, but their gear must have slowed them down somewhat, because I outran them. Soon, I found an exterior door and bashed it open. I was on the other side of the slaughterhouse, but quickly found the road on the west end of the lot, leading me back to the truck. Eventually, I did feel safer outside, now that I could catch my breath, walk around, and hide. While doing so, I took one more glance towards the building. My legs froze at what I saw. I saw the three men looking at me through an open truck dock. They looked the same, except they had red, glowing eyes. I began to run now, losing my mind in fear. As I saw my truck up the road, another bull bellow echoed through the street and hurt my ears. How could this be happening? I hopped in my car and peeled out of there. Looking in my rear view mirror, I couldn't see anything, but I was forever shaking by what I found. Never again would I explore the abandoned buildings, especially where many animals were killed. What did those men want with me? What would I have done? What was that creature? I have no idea. After doing a bunch of research online, reading a bunch of stuff on Reddit, and even listening to shows like Swamp Dweller, 
I just kind of think it might have been some sort of skimwalker. I don't know. Was it a skimwalker? By Cam. I want to describe the layout of the cabin we were staying in. Outside, the deck wraps around the house like a C-shape, and the main entrance faces south. The second is facing west, which is where the meadow resides. The stairs on the west, where the field is, have 15 steps and are roughly 10 feet high. The south entrance is above four to the south entrance is about four degrees. On the cabin's west side, big panel glass windows connect to two windows and a screen door directly underneath it. I'll explain more as the story goes on, but hopefully that all makes sense to you. My mom and the same boyfriend went on a cruise a year later. I was staying with his parents for the time being. They wanted to go to the cabin, and my mom's boyfriend's brother also came. Their names are Mary, Ben, and Kenny. Mary and Ben are his parents, and Kenny is his brother. After the trip, I felt off about the entire thing. I shrugged it off, and with the previous event, I tried to just push it to the back of my mind. If you don't remember, in a few episodes back, Swamp Dweller shared my story about my initial encounter with what I thought might be a skinwalker. I didn't want to return to that treehouse since no one else would be with me. Still being young, I still wandered around. I was tossed towards the front and looking towards the treehouse, knowing we possibly escaped death. My skin started to crawl for some odd reason. Then I had this feeling of being watched again. As I stared at the treehouse, I see it suddenly collapse onto one side. I got too freaked out so I ran inside. As the day went on I did various things such as watching a movie, eating dinner, doing the dishes, and watching a college football game. I passed out on the couch and woke up sometime around midnight due to the lightning and thunder outside. I rubbed my eyes and started up the stairs toward bed. I laid down on my bed. The one I was laying on was right on the edge of the open area upstairs. I felt uneasy about being there as something was definitely peering in at me. I could just feel it in my bones. I looked towards the panel glass windows as lightning strikes. I saw a massive, giant creature up against the glass, tapping it. A complete chill came over my body and I realized what I had just seen. The same creature that saw me get up and go upstairs. Knowing I was there, for some odd reason I got up and headed into the kitchen, hiding behind the bar-like table against the countertop. As I was sitting there, the tapping was getting more frequent. Freaked out, I closed my eyes and ended up in a fetal position. I was shaking on the floor, right next to the cupboards above is the kitchen sink. Above the sink is a small window. I opened my eyes and there in the window was the creature. My body went cold and I went frozen. The face of the beast looked almost human. The eyes were pitch black and the hair was damp due to the rain. It had a flat nose and a mouth like a gorilla. I moved my head to where I couldn't see it anymore, shaking with tears rolling down my face. I heard it walk over to the door and I heard it rattling. Thank goodness, at that moment Kenny walked out of the room and headed to the bathroom. He turned around and saw me on the floor shaking like a beaten dog. He asked, what are you doing? I couldn't even answer. I was filled with fear. Soon, Mary came out to see what was happening, possibly waking her up. They calmed me down, they let me sleep in their third bedroom, and the next day we left. My parents were coming back from their vacation. Of course, Mary and Ben told them about what happened. My mom asked me what happened from the first part to the second since I could never go up the mountains without thinking of this creature and freaking out. When did it leave the deck? Uh, I believe it was some sort of Sasquatch, but maybe it was a Wendigo or Skimwalker. I, I don't really know. What do you guys in the audience think? I saw something while camping I'll never forget. By Anonymous. Howdy. My name's Elijah, but everyone calls me Gator. But that is a different story. Last year, I and my friends Zach and Piper went camping out in the woods near my house. We live in a small town called Supply, North Carolina. 
The first day went by as always. We got to the pond, unpacked our gear, and got the camo set up, and then we lit a fire. The second day is when things started to get strange. We got up, smoked a joint, and went fishing. There's a river about a half a mile through the woods, so we thought we would go catch something and eat it. My friend Zach pointed out some strange footprints as we were walking there, though. I am a hunter, and the deer down here are not much bigger than a Great Dane, but there were bipedal deer tracks going towards our camp, which we all found a bit weird. I bent down to look at them more closely, and they were almost bigger than my hand. I've never seen deer tracks this big. We continued down the trail talking about the tracks we saw and got down to the river at last. We sat down at our usual spot and started to fish about an hour in or so. We had five decent sized red drum and we packed up and started heading back. We were excited about our catches, but suddenly we heard a loud scream that went on for what felt like 15 seconds. It was far off, so I wasn't worried about it. I just told them it was probably a panther or something like that, since a few mountain lions had been sighted in the area. As we got back to the camp, we noticed that the same tracks that we had saw earlier were now all around our tents, and three giant claw marks were outside the tent. I thought that someone might have been messing with us. We bring a lot of our friends out here, and a few did know that we were going. We stirred the fire back up and made breakfast. The rest of the day was pretty chill. We took a few walks, went swimming, had a few smokes. We talked about a lot of stuff, and pretty much just, you know, we're getting ready for our summer to be over. When we all went to bed, I woke up to the sound of that screaming we had heard earlier. But it was much closer this time. I grabbed my Mossberg 500 and climbed out of my tent. Zack and Piper were already out of theirs. I had asked if any of them had heard it, and Zack said obviously they had heard it or they wouldn't be out of their tents. I threw a few logs in the fire, and we all stand around, listening to the sounds of the woods. Suddenly, it got dead quiet. The sounds of the birds, the bugs, and everything else seemingly went mute. We started to hear heavy footsteps around the camp, we looked around but didn't see a single thing. A few moments later, something stepped into the light of the fire, but we could barely see this thing because it was so massive. I'm six foot six, and this thing had at least a good three or more feet on me. At first, we thought it was a person, but honestly, it was just too big and almost solid white. It had the body of a man, but instead of where this guy's head should be, there was a deer skull. It crept closer, and I fired three slug rounds into its chest. This thing stopped and looked at me. I told Zack to grab the keys out of my tent, and this thing looked over at Piper. When it did, I shot a fourth round into its stomach. Right as I did this, its head shot straight towards me, and it smiled at me. That's what I think it was doing anyway. Zack had already jumped in the car and started it up, I grabbed Piper and led her towards the car, keeping my gun aimed at this thing. When we all had gotten in, Zack hit the pedal and went flying down the road. We were doing at least 60 down this old dirt trail when Piper let out a scream. When she did, there was a loud thud and the SUV jolted to the side. I looked behind us and this thing was keeping pace with the car. Zack does an almost unhuman thing and somehow gets the car to speed even faster. Once we hit the main road, we were safe, and we kept going. Ever since then, we have not been out camping, and I am not sure if I ever will again. We have not said anything to anyone about this encounter until now. I've been listening to your channel for the last year and a half, and I figured maybe someone else had an encounter like this in this area. I don't know what it is that I saw. By Midori. Hey Swamp, it's me again, Midori. This happened a couple of nights ago. So unlike some of the other things I have sent you, 
the details, at least those that I know, are still fresh in my mind. So for some context, so for some context, this happened at a park called Stolsoft Park. The whole thing is inside of my city. I would say it is maybe a square mile in total area. Sorry, I'm not too familiar with acres. It is mostly forest, with a playground facing the street on the northern end. The playground, along with the north and south entrances, are elevated hill streets, so the forest gradually goes downward, meeting at a valley in the center. The playground is bordered by a forest on two sides. The swing set, where I was, is maybe ten feet away from the fence separating one side of the playground from the forest. I'm sorry if that is confusing. I should say I usually go swing there any time between 9 at night and midnight, mainly because I like being the only person in the park. I am not some curmudgeon who does not like kids or anything, I just prefer less crowded places in general. So, on this night I believe it was around 11 something, when I hear shuffling behind the fence. This is not unusual at all, and I don't react in any way. Maybe five minutes later, I heard it again, and it sounded like something approximately human-sized. My first thought was a mountain lion. Despite the park posting signs warning of mountain lion activity, I have never actually seen one here. They do not worry me anyway, because a mountain lion will not usually attack or even really care about a human if you don't do something stupid like mess with their young. I have encountered them elsewhere. They generally mind their own business. My next thought was a creeper, and I mentally prepared to jump off and run to my car. At this point, I was looking at the fence. On that night, the moon was not shining per se, but it was casting its glow, giving minimal visibility. At ten feet away, however, I would at least be able to see movement, especially of this being's assumed size. As I was mulling it over in my head, I heard not exactly what you call a growl, but almost a moaning, I guess. It lasted about five seconds. Then I heard something moving away. The weird thing was, the movement came from quite a ways off, in the same direction, and the vocalization came from right at the fence, ten feet away from me. Now at this point, the sensible thing to do would be to just leave, but having just happened, I was dumbfounded and just continued swinging for another 30 seconds or so. And then, of course, it got more strange. As I was swinging, I saw a flashlight in the distance, near where the playground hits the streets. This is maybe 60 or 70 feet from me. With obstacles such as play structures and other things in the way, my first thought that it was a police officer or something of the sort. The playground technically is closed, and they all are because of the corona situation. But I've swung at parks after they've been closed for years, and if the police even care about things like that, they've never even bothered me. The guy came a bit closer, but he is moving at an angle towards me in the general sense, but moving at an angle. As in, if you envision the area as a clock with me at six, he started at 12, and he is moving towards seven. Sorry, that is the only way I can really describe it. Ten feet from the swing set in the opposite direction of the fence, there's a 20 foot by 20 foot metal overhang with one of those fishnet pattern tables for picnics. I hopped off the swing and crouched behind it. In the day, this would be a completely useless hiding place, but at night, a person hiding behind it would just look like a part of a mass of shadow. I watched as it approached, and while I could not make out any details or colors, I could see that he was dressed almost like a hunter from the show Supernatural. He looked to be wearing baggy pants, a vest and a hat, the most common kind of hat with a duckbill on the front, the kind they sell at lids. There looked to be things strapped on his arms and legs. Mind you, visibility was unbelievably bad, and I may have mistaken many of these details. He was carrying a flashlight aimed at the ground in front of him, on his opposite hand, it looked like he had some sort of stick, like a gymnastics baton or something. All I know was the general shape. It occurred to me that if this guy fancied himself a hunter, then a pale girl swinging at midnight is probably the worst thing you can be. 
Either way, this situation now seemed potentially dangerous. If this person came close, I decided to run for the far fence, leading into the forest. Note that between me and my car, despite the small size of the forest, finding a person hiding in it would be impossible at night. Even with a flashlight, I am completely familiar with the forest. I am currently 27, and I have been coming here since I was 7 or 8 years old. Even in complete darkness, I could navigate it well enough to hide if I had to. As I crouched down, the person stopped briefly, then continued down into the forest entrance. That is basically the ending of our encounter. I waited for a few minutes, and then I tried to see if I could still see it. I am not sure if the two events were related at all. As far as the noise I heard, I know what mountain lions sound like. The only other fauna in the park are deer, squirrels, and insects. I honestly do not know if this was a skimwalker or anything like that. All I heard was the sound. There was no smell, and I did not get necessarily a terrible feeling from that person with the flashlight, even though they were dressed weird. Also, I don't think this force would be big enough to house something like that, but maybe it could be just big enough for something to stop by for a few days. We do have a good-sized forest farther up in the mountains, not too far away, called Hubbard Park. You probably have to travel about 20 minutes through the suburbs to get there, but I'm not sure that it would be impossible for a skimwalker to bounce between these two locations. Do you guys think I saw a skimwalker? Do you guys think I possibly saw somebody hunting a skimwalker? I don't know. Something resides on these trails, and it's not human. By Anonymous. In the 80s growing up, we didn't have all the distractions that kids have today so we had to make up our own things to do. Many times, this meant going outside, going hunting, or making up games. For our generation, our parents told us to be outside, but for us that lived in a small town, these activities were in abundance. There was one type of activity that almost everyone took part in, and this was riding some type of ATV or dirt bike. For me, this was one of my biggest pastimes when I was a child, when I was just seven years old, a man on the highway was selling a YZ80. Now for me, this was an awesome sight. All I could think of was getting on that dirt bike and riding all day around where I lived. But my dad had other ideas. He thought I was much too young to have something so awesome. It took a few weeks of constant badgering for me to convince my dad to buy it for me. But in the end, my perseverance prevailed, and my dad bought it for me. I was so excited and could not contain myself. Now, I did not know how to ride a dirt bike at the time. The first time that I got on the machine, I popped the clutch, did a wheelie, and flipped the bike. Now, this did not inspire any confidence with my father. It took a little time, but I quickly got good at riding this badass machine. Luckily, I was able to use this open field to perfect my skill as a dirt bike rider. As my friends learned that I had a dirt bike, they started taking me around and showing me a few trails around my town. It slowly became one of our pastimes. We would do this almost every single day after school. It was one of my memories as a child that I really hold on to. There was one place that we went riding. This place was called Emmeline's. I never really knew the person or why it was called this, but there was an old, abandoned house way out in the middle of these woods. This old house had been out there for many years. It had a lot of good riding trails around it, from hills to creeks to wide open trails that you could really open your machine on. Most of the time, there were two or three of us that would go at the same time, but there were times that I would go out on my own. I had done these solo rides several times before this day. On this day, I could not go right after school. I had some homework from school that I could not get done at school, so I had to go home and get it done. I could not ride until everything was done unfortunately, but I think most people know that. So it was later on in the day that I could take my daily ride. It was about 6 in the afternoon before I took off. Now this was in the summertime, so it didn't usually get dark until around 8.30 or so, 
so I knew it would not be a very long ride because my dirt bike did not have any lights on it. I would have a few hours before I had to return home, though. Emmeline's was only about five minutes from my house. As I got on my machine, I could not help but put a smile on my face. I absolutely love this thing. I love to be on my bike. After fueling up the machine and checking it over, I put it in neutral, kicked the bike, and started it up. Now, a few days before I had broken my clutch cable, so after starting it, I had to give it a push, jump on, and throw it into gear. This was no big deal, I had done it before. I got rather good at it. My dad had to order the cable and it had not come in quite yet. Off I went, as happy as a young boy could be on his dirt bike. I got to the trails and immediately jumped right in. I'd been ripping up the trails for about an hour and not seen anyone else on them. I guess everyone had better things to do on that day. In the middle of the woods was an open field. This field was about four or five acres big if I had to guess. It had a fence built up around it. The fence had been up for a long time. It was rusted and broken in quite a few places. But for the most part, it was intact and in decent shape. Like I said, I had been riding hard for about an hour and had felt the call of nature. Since I had not seen anyone around, I decided to just stop on the trail and relieve myself. Now, I must mention that the dirt bike I had was a racing bike, so it did not have a kickstand unfortunately. So, I had to stop and lean it against a fence post. As I was relieving myself, I noticed that it was very, very quiet. Now, I did not think too much about this because I had been riding for about an hour straight. The dirt bike was pretty loud, so I just figured it was because of me. As I was going to the bathroom, I heard some rustling about 50 or 60 yards away from me. I looked that way and I did not see anything at first. So, I assumed that it was probably just a little squirrel since they were everywhere out here. Finishing my business, I started to feel anxious for some reason. This heavy feeling came over me, like I was being watched. I look all around me, but once again, I could see nothing. The bike was only a couple of feet away from me, so I started walking toward it. I took one step and heard something start walking behind me. I immediately turned around expecting to see one of my friends trying to sneak up on me. But to my astonishment, there was absolutely no one there. Trying to shrug the experience off, I walked to my bike. But every step I took, I swear I heard one step behind me. By this time I was so scared, I did not know what I was going to do. Figuring the only thing I could do was run the few feet to my bike, jump on it, and take off. This had to be a seamless action though, since I did not have a clutch to take off with. I had to kickstart the bike, push it, and throw it into gear all in one motion, if I was going to get away from whatever was behind me. Gathering up all the courage and strength I had, I ran. Jumping on the bike, kickstarting it, and shoving it all at the same time was very hard. Somehow, while I was doing all of this, I never stopped hearing the footsteps behind me. I knew wh whatever it was, it was only a few yards behind me. Once I was on my way, I felt a sudden breeze on my back, like something had made a swipe at me and just missed. This scared me even more and put more energy and urgency into me. As I slammed the bike into gear, I gave the bike all that it had. I was shifting gears and sliding around every corner like I was a professional. I looked back once and I could see the trees moving, but I was never able to see anything. Even though I did not see anything, it did not take away my sense of emergency to get out of those woods. Once I made it back to the road, I stopped, turned the bike off, and tried to gather myself. It took me a few minutes, but as I did I heard it. The most god-awful scream I had ever heard. It started out low, but by the time that it ended, it was so loud that I, I could feel it in my chest. I got that bike going and got home as fast as I could. It took me a long time before I went back into those woods, but when I did finally go back, it would always be with friends. This was a moment in my life that I would never forget. An Unexplained Incident in Greeley by Frank W. 
In the sultry summer of 2002, I was a mere 11 years old, marked by youthful curiosity and boundless imagination. My family had embarked on a life-altering journey, forsaking the city's comforting embrace for the enigmatic allure of a minor, isolated hamlet known as Greeley, nestled deep within northeast Pennsylvania's dense, foreboding woods. The whispers of Native American tribes still lingered in the rustling leaves and the distant echoes of forgotten rituals, adding an eerie layer to our new surroundings. Our time in Pennsylvania had extended over several months, and as August drew to a close, the imminent return to school cast a shadow over the carefree days of summer. On that particular night, I was nestled in my dimly lit room the TV screen casting a flickering shadow across the wall. The clock's hands suggested that it was around 9 or 10 in the evening, and the world outside surrendered to inky darkness. As the eerie silence enveloped me, a sound shattered the tranquility, a faint but unmistakable tapping against my bedroom window. My heart, innocent and unaccustomed to fear, somersaulted within my chest, Uncertainty gripped me as I tiptoed towards the source of this sinister disturbance. Initially drawn to ward off the darkness, the blinds now beckoned me to be raised. With trembling hands, I gingerly lifted the blinds and gazed into the abyss. What met my gaze was beyond my realm of childish nightmares. Two piercing, malevolent orbs burned in with a sinister glow. Their unnatural, luminescence tearing through the shroud of night. I reeled back in sheer terror, slamming the blinds shut with frantic desperation that fueled my every motion, seeking refuge from the unearthly presence that had violated my sanctuary. I fled to the living room and huddled on the couch, my heart pounding in a frantic rhythm. The dread that descended upon me that fateful night was inescapable, and sleep was an elusive mirage. When the first light of dawn pierced the sky, I mustered the courage to confide in my mother, recounting the horrors that unfolded in the darkness. Her reassurances, though well-intentioned, fell flat. She dismissed the haunting experience as the antics of the neighbor's cat, attributing my terror to a child's vivid imagination. However, with unwavering certainty in that moment, I knew this was no ordinary feline prowler. The malevolent gaze I had encountered had been way too high up in the trees, far beyond the reach of any earthly cat. My young mind could not yet comprehend the sinister forces at play that night. Years would pass, and my understanding of the paranormal would deepen. In retrospect, I witnessed something truly evil that night manifest. What I believe it was was a skimwalker, a shape-shifting harbinger of dread. It gnaws at the edges of my memories, a haunting specter that sends shivers down my spine any time I think of it. Freaky Matrix Glitch by Vic A. Hey Swamp Dweller, thanks for checking out my story. I'll start this by saying that I have spent my entire life living in and around America's deep forest, deserts, and mountainous regions across several states. So I've seen my share of weird experiences, from strange sounds in the woods and lights in the desert. But this one? This one's a bit different, and I can't seem to rationalize it. This isn't an overly scary story, but the circumstances are perplexing. Freaky glitch in the matrix, if you will. This started about three years ago, I do believe. My partner and I were on a road trip traveling back from a week in Colorado. We were somewhere in western Nebraska and needed to stop for gas. It was somewhere in the middle of the afternoon in a sunny, clear day on the road. We pulled off at an exit advertised for a gas station and had to drive about a quarter mile down to a connecting road, where we then found our stop. It was a tiny, family-owned looking shop with two dated-looking pumps outside. I filled up while my partner was sitting in the car, and after I hung up the pump, I went inside to go pay and get snacks for the road. Now this is where things get weird. 
This gas station had no drink coolers inside, only racks of warm bottled water, chips, and various snacks. Only these snacks were all brands only sold in Ireland, Scotland, and England. There were no Lay's, Snickers, and beef jerky you would regularly see at a rural gas station in the heartland of America. This was kind of weird, but I guess it was maybe the gimmick of the gas station that maybe they just had imported snacks. I left it at that and tried to move on with a standard drive back home. But of course, that's not the end of this story. Later that year, I drove to Colorado with my dad for spring break. I usually go to Colorado once or twice a year, and I am very familiar with the journey. I know where everything is along the road, and take the same highway through Nebraska every single time to get there. On the way there, I told my dad about the story of my partner and my gas station experience, and as we got closer to where I needed to stop was, I found that there was no exit. No sign of a gas station where we stopped, nothing. The same thing happened on the route back a week later. There was nothing there. Four different trips later, no sign of an exit, absolutely nothing. I've looked on Google Maps, along I-80, looking for all the exits anywhere near it, and I just can't find anything. It was a memorable stop because it looked like a small gray house rather than a big truck stop like every other stop on I-80. Where were we? And what gas did I put in my car? I don't know. All I know is that the snacks that were supposedly there were delicious. And I'm pretty sad that that stop doesn't live in real life, because, honestly, the snacks are great. Thanks for reading, Swamp Dweller. I know the story's not necessarily the most creepy, but it definitely was a head-scratcher. Rougarou Encounter by Gus My name is Gus. I'm 17, and I live in a rural southern Louisiana town. It's nice here sometimes, even if there are a lot of mosquitoes, snakes, and gators. I've been bitten by plenty of mosquitoes in my time, and I know a few people who have been bitten by snakes and even by gators. I'll spare you the details, but this story is something other than the many bayou monsters we know about. This is a story about a Rougarou, or what I think was a Rougarou. So, in July this year, I took my girlfriend Jules on a little ride around. We didn't drive around town very much, just in the countryside. It was remarkable that night. We could see the full moon and millions of stars. I stopped the car beside this sort of bayou swamp area. The cypress trees and water all just looked beautiful. We sat on the car's hood, cuddling and enjoying the night for about half an hour until we heard something walking. We tried to find out where it was coming from. After a couple of minutes, it stopped. We figured it must be a deer, a raccoon, or something along those lines. Then I saw something moving around in the water, and we both agreed it kind of looked like a gator. We weren't about to take any chances. So we were just about to get back into the car and drive off when the so-called alligator raised its head out of the water and looked to be like a giant dog head. I didn't say anything about it at first to Jules, and I just kept quiet because I didn't want to freak her out. And so we got some time around dropping her off at her house and she asked me, Hey, did you see something weird over by the bayou earlier? I answered, Yeah, you saw that giant head of a dog in the water, right? She nodded her head. She looked at me with her face like she was debating whether or not she or I were crazy. A few weeks later, we took a day trip to New Orleans. Walking on the street, we discussed what we saw that night. Some old guy overheard us and wanted to know if he could ask us a few questions. He first asked, did it look like a giant dog? We nodded. His next question, what color were its eyes? We didn't remember honestly. He said it makes sense because Rougarou has all different eye colors, and sometimes they change on a dime. And when you see a werewolf looking monster in the bayou, the last thing you're looking is at its eyes. Y'all are real lucky it wasn't hungry or y'all'd be gone, he said and walked off. Thank you for sharing my story. I've been out to that bayou a couple of times. Maybe it was our imagination, but I haven't seen a thing since then. The Spectre That Whispered in My Ear by Anonymous
So, for a little bit of backstory, you can call me Jay and I am 19. This all happened on July 3rd, 2020. I live in a rural area on the east coast. My house is surrounded by forest and a bit of swampy patch. Anyway, on to my story. My friend's mom invited me over for a small pre 4th of July fireworks show at their house. It was around 9.30 and I had just finished dinner, so my mom and I were both going over. I threw some flip flops on and grabbed a drink and my flashlight and headed out the door. I unhooked the bike from the chain and pushed it down into the driveway. I turned it around and biked down the dark tree covered back road towards his house. As I rode, holding my flashlight in one hand and steering with the other, I began hearing something, like somebody whispering in my ear. I looked over and didn't seem to see anything. I could not understand what this thing was trying to say, but as I got further down the road, I heard more of these whispers coming from my left, and then to my right. The whispers grew louder and louder. My mind starts to hurt from hearing all the whispers around me. Then. Something stopped my heart right there. A scream from in the woods way off in the distance, like some woman getting murdered. It made me want to stop, but I couldn't, so I kept pedaling harder. But as I pedaled harder, I heard the screaming getting closer and closer as it started to follow me. Then I heard something else from behind me as well. It sounds like somebody running and laughing, psychotically, like a murderer would. I pedaled even harder and faster. My legs started to cramp, but I didn't care. I wanted to get out of the trees and into an open area. I could not tell if my mind was playing tricks on me, but I felt like I was so much further away from the opening than it was before. So I just kept on pedaling as I saw a car go down the street. I was trying to get closer to it so I could get into the light. I kept going with the full intent of getting away from whatever was happening. As I neared the opening finally, I heard the whisper again in my ear. I felt like something, breathing against my ear as it spoke a few words that I finally understood. Protect your shadow. It spoke, and as I felt this icy cold breath brush my cheeks, I soon arrived there in probably about nine minutes, which I could have been there a whole lot later if I hadn't been dealing with whatever that was. I pulled in and we had a good time lighting off fireworks, big bangs, and sprayers, and all the fun things you could possibly do with a fireworks kit. But something happened while I was there. Something had happened between my friend and his little brother, where it ended up with his little brother on the ground crying and the big brother getting backhanded by his dad. As soon as the backhand hit, I heard the snap of a finger by my ear, and I turned around and there was nobody there. The voice whispered again, the shadow is now ours. Thank you for the treasure. I froze in that split second and thought, What's happening right now? Like, what the heck? I turned around to see the little brother get up and sit in a chair and have an ice pack on his cheek. As the night went on, I heard a whipping in the slight breeze. Then I heard what sounded like a cracking off in the woods. I snapped my head to the right to look out into the open farm pasture. As the full moon lit up the ground a bit, I saw a shadow outline of something within the tree line. It started running towards me as I fell back into the chair. Behind me, as I got closer to the fire, we were sitting around. It got right in front of me as I sat and staring into this thing's red eyes. A feeling of dread and fear took over me. I did not know what to say. I did not want to ask them if they saw it too, because then they might think I was crazy. But here I was, staring at this thing straight in its eyes. We are not here to harm you. We are here to harvest the shadows. It spoke in a whisper, right in my ear again. I stood up and walked towards the shadow, and as soon as I got to where it stood, it vanished into thin air. I jumped back and looked back around trying to figure out where it went. I looked over to my right in the doorway, the barn. The shadow made the motion of, come here. I looked at them and told them I was going to go to the bathroom. So I walked to the barn and peeked inside of it. I heard the pig squeal a little as I felt a cold breeze blast into me. I looked down the walkway of the barn and heard something creak above me. I looked up and there was a shadow crouched on a beam above me, looking almost like a Spider-Man type creature. It had a weird posture. I nearly fell, 
trying to back out of there, freaking out. It jumped down in front of me, the impact making no noise at all. I stumble back, falling on my ass. I back up and my back hits the barn door. It slowly walked towards me and crouches in front of me and holds out its hand. In its hand sat a dark version of my friend. His shadow. What are you doing with it? I had no idea if this thing could hear me. It made a small sighing noise as I saw something like a mouth form on this thing. Its yellow teeth and red eyes were absolutely terrifying me. It stares at me as it holds out the small version of my friend. It smiles and hands me the small figure and I look at it. It gave a small chuckle and vanished again. I slowly begin to stand up as the light slowly starts to flicker on and off in the barn. I start looking around, scared out of my mind. I hear laughter all around me and then something goes by flying. I run to the door and try to open it. The door would not open though. As I turned and looked as the light shut off and then it began to flicker like a strobe light would. As I looked down to the big barn doors in front of the tractor, sitting on the tractor was that shadow person. It stood up and jumped down from the tractor, walking towards me. With every flicker, it got closer and closer to me. It got right up into my face and blew a huge breath of cold, freezing air into my face as I grabbed the doorknob and opened it as I ran through the door, slamming it. I was terrified of what had happened. I had heard a giant bang above me as a firework went off, I slowly walked back to the fire. My heart was beating like a bass drum, and my face was paler than an albino. I sat down in my chair and watched the fireworks go off, hearing them explode. And as they explode, they light up the field a little bit, and I keep thinking I see that shadow out of the corner of my eye. As we winded down for the night sometime around midnight, we went in and got a ride from my friend's dad and his truck. As we rode back to my place, I got a headache that was pounding in my head constantly. I looked over. Sitting across from me was the shadow. It gave me the motion to shush, and I did. I just rode in the truck until we got back, and I got out and unloaded my bike from the bed of the truck and locked it back up on the porch. I went into the house and told my parents about all the fireworks, and they were happy to hear it. I did not say a word about anything else that I encountered, because I did not want to end up in a psych ward. So I just went upstairs and lay down. As I laid in bed, the shadow sat at the edge of my bed and looked at me. Keep hold of your friend's shadow, or else you'll pay the consequences. And with that it snapped its fingers and disappeared. And with that I haven't seen it till this day. I still to this day have no idea what it was. I don't know if it was a demon or a poltergeist, but whatever it was could have killed me or taken my body over or whatever. But it seemed like it was playing games with me. I still have that shadowy statue in my room, put away somewhere. I know if I'll need it, I'll be able to find it again. I still want to know what it was, but I doubt I, I want to know. This thing terrified me more than whatever I had to deal with months ago. The unknown is truly unknown, and it's something we might never understand. My Town is Cursed by... Anonymous. First off, I would like to start by saying that I am not a professional writer by any means, but have always been attracted by everything paranormal. I was not always the bravest person as a kid, but I liked it all even still. I have experienced many things throughout my life, some things that seem like they are from a movie or a book. This time I'll be telling you of a more mild and a little less strange thing that happened to me while walking home one night. Before I start, I will give you a little bit of background, so you better understand my story. I was born and raised in a small town in Mexico. Everyone knew everyone, and even though we had cars we had all mostly walked everywhere. There was crime, but it was exceedingly rare, and nothing violent really ever happened. I am the youngest of five, and my parents were rarely ever home. This meant I was able to stay up late and go pretty much anywhere I wanted. My hometown is in sort of a valley, with most of the town on one side of the tallest hills. 
My house was on a block right on the foothills of the steepest hill of my street, directly perpendicular to the two main streets leading up to it. One of these streets was essentially a main road. It was used to go up to a hill which was used for religious traditions. Anyway, this main road was mostly populated by family with my grandmother on my mom's side of the family living near the middle of the hill. Her house itself was small but the plot was big and had my aunt's houses scattered around it. This was still quite a long walk from my street, probably five minutes of walking. My family was a very typical Mexican family and would gather at her house pretty much every single night. On one night, I ended up staying way past my usual time with a few cousins. By the time I started heading home, it was well past midnight. There were street lights, but they were very spaced out along the street, which was blocked off by a bunch of trees, making my area very dark. It was creepy, especially for a kid, but the moon was out and it helped ease my nerves just a bit. I began walking downhill toward my house the entire time, I just kept feeling weird, like I was being followed. I did not necessarily feel like I was in danger, I guess, but I felt very uneasy. The entire walk, my heart felt like it was going to jump into my throat. I kept walking down the street, having to look back and around every so often. Eventually, I reached the corner, turned toward my house, and now I was on my street. There has been a house that has been abandoned for an exceptionally long time. It has always given me the creeps, and it was the third house from the corner. I was just about to walk by it. Every time I walked by, I would always walk on the opposite side of the street, which did not even have a sidewalk. I would have walked through that same path that night, but this time it was blocked off by these huge piles of sand and dirt, probably some kind of construction work nearby. That, combined with a huge delivery truck parked on the curb belonging to my neighbors, forced me to walk in the middle of the street. As I approached the house, I had to mentally prepare and give myself the courage to walk in front of it. My heart began racing. I was always scared of the house, but for some reason, that night just seemed so much worse somehow. I forced myself to keep walking, and as I did, I heard someone call me from the direction of the house. I froze. My heart in my mouth, and turned to look, but I did not see anyone or anything. I felt a huge wave of relief wash over me. I began breathing again, and I had been apparently holding my breath. I was about to start walking again when I heard the voice again this time. I turned to look at a boy. He looked to be about my age at the time, maybe a little bit younger. It struck me as odd more than anything to see a kid my age standing right next to me. I did not even think twice about the fact that I could see him perfectly even though he was standing in the dark. No lights coming from an abandoned house, and even a tree blocking the moon and street light. He kept standing there unmoving for a few more moments, not saying a word, just kind of staring at me. The whole time I was trying to process what was going on. He spoke again, asking me to go with him, saying we would play together. I kept trying to speak but could not seem to form words. It felt like hours went by. The whole time I was frozen in place, just staring at this kid, my racing mind, and now realized he seemed to be glowing. I began to tremble the entire time. I kept trying to move to scream, but I, I just couldn't. I couldn't even move to, to run. I wanted to get away desperately. That kid stood there staring back at me, not moving, not blinking. He spoke one more time before walking a few steps closer to me. He seemed to pass like a shadow or something as he walked. His figure turned dark and then became bright again. As this happened, he called my name. My full name. And then I realized he looked like me somehow. Th th this, sh this shook to my core. I jerked back at the sight of this. It was me, but the eyes were all wrong. They looked like they were full of hatred. I, I regained control of myself. I screamed no at whatever this thing was and ran faster than I ever have before in my entire life. I still have no idea what that thing was. It didn't seem to follow me, and I never saw it again after that. 
it still scares me to think back to that day. People ask all the time here to try to figure out what it is that they saw, but I honestly kind of don't want to know. Anyway, if you do decide to read this on your channel, thank you so much for your time. It Mimicked a Park Ranger by Brittany W. I've been listening to this show for quite some time now. I also love to read scary stories on the internet, but I thought it was time to finally share one of my own. I don't know if it's a cryptid, but I don't know where else to share this. This happened quite some time ago. I was about 19 when it happened and almost had forgotten about it until my friends had brought it up. We all were trying to forget about it subconsciously, I'd say. This happened back in July of 2017 in Greer, Arizona, there were seven of us in the group, including my boyfriend at the time, and we wanted to do some distant camping for my birthday, despite the increase in mountain sickness cases. The term they told me was off-grid camping, but it was much further than most people would go. We packed up our friend's FJ Cruiser and set out for our destination. We were given by some random person who knows the area. We could only drive so far before we had to get out and hike the rest of the way, which was to be expected. Once we reached our destination, we wasted no time prepping some beers and beginning to get drunk and smoke as you do when you're young and dumb. We even had some people pass by who thought we were the authorities. We set up camp and by the time we were done, it was beginning to get dark out and just in time for the spooky stories. My boyfriend and I did not last long with the stories because we had fallen asleep. We honestly got a little too cross-faded between the drinks and the joints, and if I'm being honest, we went to bed pretty early. So did my other friends, though. Only three were up late telling the stories from what I got. My boyfriend and I share some intimate moments before ultimately falling asleep, so here's where it starts to get disturbing. I was in and out of consciousness, but I remember hearing the zipper to the tent open slowly. I didn't know anything of it then because I was gone, if you know what I mean. The next thing I remember is my boyfriend weakly touching my elbow as if I was, like, facing him. Uh, I didn't really wake up because I thought maybe he was just trying to wake me up, until I heard him gasping for air. When my eyes opened, I saw this dark, clouded figure with an ugly, disgustingly disfigured face hovering over my boyfriend with his mouth open. I screamed as loud as I could and ran out of the tent towards the fire, practically naked, before I stumbled into the dirt. I remember seeing an older man come from the woods yelling out, I'm a park ranger! with a gun rushing to the tent. In my panic, I remember looking around at all my friends coming out of their tent and surrounding me, making it hard to see what was happening with my boyfriend. The voices of all my friends talking at once were messy as I filled with worry and grief, leaving my boyfriend alone in that tent with whatever the freak that thing was. Then a second younger man came out from a similar area of the woods. That's when I noticed the park ranger was no mere man. He looked off and began to shriek just like this creature who was shrieking in pain as people jumped on the tent and tried to get my boyfriend. The older man, who I thought was a park ranger, began to look at us with demonic eyes. My friends and I watched in disbelief as the younger person began to pour what looked like water onto this creature and older man. They both began screaming and shaking violently. They both eventually gurgled from the liquid and ran off into the woods, never to be seen or heard from again, at least by us. My boyfriend, he, he was incredibly shaken, but he was okay ultimately. He stood up, got out of the tent, and was trembling. He could barely breathe, he was coughing up a lung. I'm not entirely sure what was happening. He explained it very similar to that scene from Harry Potter, where the Dementor comes and like sucks out their soul. That's what he said it felt like. He just couldn't breathe. Don't ask me what we saw that night, or who those people were, or that creature or fake park ranger was. I'm thankful to be alive, because I know if they didn't show up, we would have all probably been in the following headline of the paper. I Know It Was Real by Cassie I grew up in an industrial town in the north of England. We live in a mill cottage down a remote path. You would only know there were 15 cottages down that way if you lived there. It was very remote. I could keep my bedroom curtains wide open as no other people were overlooking us. This particular night was a full moon, and it half-lit my bedroom. 
I turned to face my bedroom wall as I lay in bed because I was too lazy to get up and shut the moonlight out. After 10 minutes passed and I felt a finger prodding my shoulder. I ignored it at first, thinking it was part of a dream. It wasn't. It continued poking till it started to hurt. I turned around, and there, kneeling on the side of my bed, was an American Civil War soldier. It was illuminated in the moonlight. Now, you can remember this is the north of England and not the United States of America. He was kneeling at my side, so we were face to face. He wore a blue Civil War uniform. His hat had two yellow gold cross swords, and the hat was battered and dusty. He had a round, full face, tanned skin. I could see beads of sweat on his forehead. He stared at me and smiled. His teeth were surprisingly white against his tanned skin and black hair. I was terrified. I tried to shout for my mom, but no words came out. I put my sheets over my head. I was stone cold with fear, but sweating at the same time. Don't ask me how. Of course, he had gone when I emerged from the sheets in the morning. And of course, according to my parents, I was dreaming. But I know I wasn't. Why would an American Civil War soldier be in the north of England? This was in 1968, and I was 10 years old at the time. I knew nothing then of the U.S. Civil War or its uniformed soldiers. Back then, the history taught in our school was of Henry VIII and his unfortunate wives. I know what I saw, and I know I wasn't asleep. He was there and he was real. I still can't really work out how a soldier from way back then got into a little cottage in the north of England. Did Illinois police really chase down a UFO? I got in here about four o'clock in the morning and as I got out of my pickup truck, I happened to look over in the northeast and I seen that bright star, which I thought it was a star, shining down this way. So I goes in the inside, was in there for a few minutes and came back out to get in my truck and I looked over there again and I uh, thought to myself, oh, that's awful bright and awful low. And I just kept watching it and all once I said, it's moving, 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 moving. It was the early hours of the morning on January 5th, 2000 in Highland, Illinois. Most residents would still be in their beds enjoying their last minutes of slumber. Everything seemed as it should be until a man named Melvern Knoll seemingly noticed something odd in the sky over his miniature golf course that he owned in the Highland area. For some location perspective, Highland, Illinois is roughly 25 miles or so from St. Louis, Missouri. Melvern was a truck driver in the off-season and would be out and about making deliveries at all hours of the day and night. Melvern was completing a delivery at around 4 a.m., and once he was finished, he decided to check on his miniature golf course and make sure nothing was out of the norm. While he was arriving to the course, he noticed what he thought was a bright star in the sky to the northeast. Melvern Knoll would stop everything he was doing and observe this anomaly. Melvern quickly realized the light was heading in his direction. After a couple of minutes went by, Melvern noticed it was attached to a much larger object. He describes this object as being rectangular in shape and was roughly the size of a football field. Melvern also stated the object was tall and insanely massive all around. If you guys have watched my previous UFO documentary on the War Mr. Thing UFO sightings, this rectangular shape was also mentioned in that case as well. Could this be a possible consistency between multiple different sightings around the world? Melvern thought he better report this to the police. He drove down to the station and reported it. He didn't want to come off as a drunk or someone not sound of mind with a phone call. After relaying further information to the police, Melvern stated the object had multiple windows that lined the side of the object. Each of these windows had intense white glowing lights coming from within them. When the object got close, Melvern was able to see a plethora of dim red lights on the belly of the object. Melvern could not be sure, but he thought the object was black or a dark gray in color. The speed of the object couldn't be determined by Melvern, but he mentioned it seemed to be moving at a rather slow pace. The entirety of this sighting would last roughly five minutes or so. This doesn't end here though. This UFO would seemingly travel all around the surrounding areas. The Highland Police Department dispatcher sent this over to the Lebanon Police Department, who has jurisdiction over the area. 
Well, I just received a call from Highland PD, reference to a truck driver just stopped in and said there was a flying object in the area of Lebanon. It was like a two-story house. It had white lights and red blinking lights, and it was last seen southwest over Lebanon. Possibly, could you check the area? Officer Ed Barton would be the first to respond to the call at around 4.15 a.m., of course, Officer Barton was skeptical of this claim at first. I can't blame anyone for being a bit apprehensive about checking on an alleged UFO that is being described as a literal flying building. Initially, Officer Barton asked the dispatcher if this was some sort of joke. They assured him they were not ribbing him, and this was indeed a serious call. Officer Barton proceeded to the call. He drove toward the north end of town, just past Homer Park. He claims to have seen nothing in the sky on this drive. He then followed Whitakus Road as it takes you from the north side to the east toward Route 4. Suddenly, about halfway down the road, Officer Barton witnessed two large white lights in the sky. Officer Barton would go on to explain that these lights seemed to be very close to each other, almost as if they were connected together in some way. He mentioned the lights were so powerful and radiant that the light beams reminded him of the Japanese Rising Sun battle flag from World War II. This intrigued him, and he began to make his way closer to the strange object in the sky. As Officer Barton arrived at Route 4, he began to go south heading toward Lebanon. As he was driving, he had a clear view of the lights to his left. At many points, he would switch from watching the road in front of him to watching the phenomenal lights. He noticed the two lights seemed to have merged into one very bright light now. At this point, Barton turned on his overhead lights, thinking this may be an aircraft in distress. As Officer Barton made his way into town, he noticed the lights were now in an elongated cigar shape. They seemed to not be moving anywhere and staying stagnant. He guessed it would have been over the nearby town of Summerfield. At this point, Barton parked and got out of his vehicle. Barton noticed no sound of any kind coming from this object. The ship approached him, and he noted the object was not a cigar shape, but a triangular shape. It was described as being massive, around 75 feet in length, and roughly 40 or so feet in width. Each corner had an absolutely massive bright light on each corner. Barton estimated that the object was no more than 1,000 feet above the ground. This would be when Barton radioed into Central Command, letting them know what he was seeing. You can hear some of the transmission here. Be advised, there's a very bright white light east of town. Looks like it's just east of Summerfield. And it keeps changing colors. I'll go there and see if maybe it's an It doesn't look like an aircraft, though. There are moments where you can hear Officer Barton stutter and pause. These are the moments Barton claims the object suddenly accelerated dramatically. The movement was so quick he could hardly track it with his eyes, according to Barton. Officer Barton's encounter with this object would end as he radioed in the object would be in the area of Shiloh by the looks of it. Just a stone's throw away, eight miles southwest, Officer David Martin from the Shiloh Police Department radioed to dispatch that he could see something odd in the sky. 2550, I see something, but I don't know what that is. Right around the time Officer Martin said he saw something odd in the sky is when Officer Barton said he could no longer see the object. Martin was patrolling the south end of Shiloh at the time when he suddenly noticed the object in the sky. I had looked up in the sky and observed this huge arrow-shaped, triangular-shaped object just floating in the sky right in the open field right over here. And it had three big bright lights lighting up the entire sky just beneath the flying object. Martin said he saw three distinct bright lights, all which were facing downwards toward the ground. He mentioned that the lights did not seem to be illuminating anything under them, though. Small green and red lights were dimly shining on the back of the object, according to Officer Martin. From his best guess, Martin suggested that the object was easily only a thousand feet in the air. He thought the object would have to be 75 to 100 yards wide. Throughout the entire sighting, Officer Martin was driving slowly. His windows were also rolled down, and he could hear no sound emanating from this massive object. He eventually pulled over and got out of his car for a better look at this thing. At this time, though, much like before, 
this object picked up insane speed and took off toward the west. Officer Martin would note that the object went from roughly 15 miles per hour to easily over 100 miles per hour in no more than a few seconds time. Officer Martin's encounter with this object would end with him requesting dispatch to call the Scott Air Force Base to see if they had anything deployed. They claimed they had nothing deployed at the time. Just a few minutes later in the nearby town of Milstad, Officer Craig Stevens was on patrol when he heard the radio chatter about the odd object. His curiosity peaked. Stevens drove around the town of Milstad, trying to find anything he could, trying to just catch a glimpse of this thing. I've got that object inside also. Are you serious? It's huge. Suddenly, Officer Stevens came upon this massive object in the sky. Stevens would claim to catch a photo and sketch what he saw and created a report that he presented to the police chief. Stevens, like everyone else, estimated the object to be only about a thousand feet above the ground. It was flying very slowly at what seemed to be a casual pace. He noted no noise was seemingly coming from the object as well. He watched the object head north. It had white lights on the sides and center and a singular red light on the bottom. So far, most of the eyewitness reports have been fairly consistent outside of the lights and the shape of this object. The last notable sighting would come not long after from Dupo, Illinois. Like a few of the previous officers, this anonymous officer heard the radio chatter and decided to have a look for himself. No more than five minutes after the Milstad sighting, this officer was seeing what he claimed to be the same mysterious object in Dupo. From the time they told me that Milstad had seen it, I drove probably about five miles down the highway and pulled off the side of the road to look, and another officer from a neighboring town came up and I told him what I was doing. We both laughed about it and made a few jokes, and he left, and I got back in my car and went maybe a quarter mile, and I seen something in the sky. The officer claimed to have seen multiple bright lights, but this officer mentioned the object was high in altitude, unlike the others who claimed the object was no more than 1,000 feet in the air. It was apparently so high in the sky that the officer would never have even noticed it flying above if he hadn't been extra vigilant due to the radio chatter. I'm not sure this thing is item that you said. It's one here appears to be pretty high in the area. Our first thing, I open eye because you can see the different colors, now it just appears to be white. This officer claimed the object stayed steady toward the east of Dupo. The officer states he did observe the object through binoculars, but wasn't able to get a clear look at it, but could tell there were multiple lights on this object. Much like the others, this anonymous officer stated there were white lights on the ends of the object and red lights in the center. He could not discern a shape or size of this object, though. Now, there are civilian witnesses as well. But in the interest of keeping this video at a consumable length, I will skip over those as they don't offer too much more testimony to what we've already heard. From the reports and timeline of the radio chatter, we can pretty much piece together a direction of where this object may have been going. From the first sighting in Highland to the last sighting in Dupo, we can determine it traveled exclusively in the southwest of Illinois. The object flew right by the Scott Air Force Base it began to slow down around the Shiloh area. It began to suddenly increase in speed again around Milstad, and then began to change course toward the northwest. Now, I know many of you are going to be thinking, how could this alleged object that is so big, bright, and attention demanding go unnoticed by the Air Force? Well, I had this exact same question. So I dug around online and found a Reddit post which had a very interesting interview with the anonymous police officer from Dupo and the Scott Air Force Base. The Scott Air Force Base was asked if they saw or reported anything from that morning. They stated they received no calls about the object except the media in the aftermath of the sightings. They also state no one on the grounds of the base has reported seeing anything. They finished their statement by saying they did not track any objects via radar since radar services for the area were provided by the nearby Lambert St. Louis International Airport. The base stands firm that they were not operating any aircraft that morning. And with that, the story of the Illinois mass UFO sightings by police ends. Or does it?
With this story, like many others I have covered in the past being unsolved, the possibility of more information or a solid conclusion is still very real. It is my ultimate goal to reveal these potential leads by documenting these stories that are otherwise lost to time. This story, like many other UFO sightings, does have its fair share of inaccuracies in the descriptions given by the witnesses. The biggest difference I can find is between the initial report from Melvern Knoll and the police officers. Melvern describes a large rectangular shaped object while the others all mention a triangular shaped object. This could be explained away by simple deductions such as angles, lighting, and obstructed views. I also have to mention that the color of lights and configurations of lights seem to vary between sightings as well. It is definitely possible that the witnesses made errors in their judgments and observations. There are many theories for why the descriptions vary. Some think the object could have been slowly changing shape over time, while others think there could have been multiple different objects in the sky that morning. Ultimately, this is one of the most anomalous and interesting cases of mass UFO sightings I have ever come across. There are so many possibilities as to what these objects could be, whether they're alien, human, or something entirely different. The fact that something is watching us from above terrifies me. What do you think happened that morning in Illinois? Did these police officers all mistake something? Was there something more going on at Scott Air Force Base? Maybe we will never know. But I will keep asking and casting a light on the unknown. Being a military brat for 21 years and being an aircraft anyways, I can pretty much tell you what kind of plane it is by the engine noise. And then I figured I would call Scott myself and say, hey, look, you know, we got some pilot hot dogging out here, that kind of thing. And there was no noise, none. And when I read reports that the military were saying, well, if it was a B-2 with its flaps down, blah, 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 well, okay, that's fine, but they still make noise. I mean, that's, that's the most, but yeah, they, you can't see them on radar, but they make noise, all aircraft that I know of. And again, I don't know of all the R&D aircraft. However, all the ones that I do know of, they make some kind of noise. My Last Day as a Park Ranger by Anonymous My name is Jim. Most just call me Jimbo. I live in Pennsylvania. I am retired now, but I used to be a park ranger in the 80s and the 90s. My favorite part of my job was simply observing the natural beauty of our state. A big chunk of my time was spent simply surveying the wilderness and watching nature while I patrolled the parks I worked at. On one such patrol in September of 1992, I came upon a tree with some deep markings. I would have thought it was a bear or something like that, but the marks were just so far spread apart. They were deep claw marks from a five-fingered animal, or thing of some kind, that burrowed near halfway through the tree itself. This was strange, but it wasn't something I was thinking too hard on at the time. No. Instead, I continued my scenic tour through our beautiful countryside. In case you can't tell, I love nature. It's beautiful. Even in my retirement, I still go out and walk the parks and just take in the beauty of our lovely country. The farther away from people, the better in my opinion. I say this as nature as a natural beauty in my opinion. It's one that's simply isn't inherent in big cities with lots of noise. I'm getting off track though. I continued for the rest of my day thinking nothing much of the markings I had found. By the next morning, I was rearing and ready to go up and go to work. When I stepped outside my home though, I found something strange on my property. To help you understand just a bit better, I live in the country, partly why I mentioned my disdain for cities earlier. I have a decently sized property. Anyway, I stepped outside and found some sort of mark on a tree near my home. It was just as deep, and it made me do a double take around the property in my area. I found no strange signs or weird marks. It was just on that tree. Part of me wondered if something had followed me home. But then again, I'd seen nothing but claw marks and I was never one to let my imagination get the best of me. As such, I drove to work and once again forgot all about the markings. 
Upon arriving at work, I found sheriff cars roaming the park. I asked if I could help the lawmen, at which point they asked if I was in charge. I nodded and mentioned I was, just about to start my shift, and was asking what was wrong. It was then that I was told some very disturbing news. Someone who had been camping in the area was on their way out, and they found a dog torn to shreds. I asked if they could show me. I have always had a strong stomach, and they brought me over to a very horrible sight. A dog had its insides torn out and looked completely mutilated. It had several claw marks that seemed to run through its entire body, and much of the body was in pieces. It was such a terrible thing to see, to say the least. Law enforcement then asked if I had seen anything strange around the parks as of late. I mentioned the claw marks I had seen the other day, but I also said I had seen nothing more. They told me to keep an eye out as they believed some kind of wild animal was out there, and they were worried it could pose a threat to the public. I also got a number to call in the event that I saw anything else or found anything in the same manner as this poor dead dog. I told them I'd keep the number and I'd keep an eye out and move on to my morning duties. There was a strange air about this day. It was like any other shift, but something felt off. I'm not saying it's because of the way my day started, but the day just as a whole felt wrong. The best way I could describe it is there was a sense of foreboding in the air. About three-fourths of the way through my shift that day, I decided to go back to the area because I had a little bit of spare time. I saw those claw marks. I made my way back to the tree and looked around. I didn't find anything strange outside of the claw marks. I didn't notice any sort of footprints or paw prints or tracks. There was a bit of heaviness in the air, but I just chalked that up to the strange day I had. The remainder of my shift was quiet, and I quickly headed home once I ended work. I still remember the meal that night. A huge pot of lima beans and rice with some nice deer sausage. I went to bed that night very content with a nice full belly. Sleep is rarely as great as when you fall into a food coma. At least, in most instances. This night was not one of those instances. I crashed quickly, but I was awoken by a loud banging at my door. I got up, grabbed my shotgun, and approached the door. By the time I had reached the door, it was practically falling off its hinges. I had really had no time to process what was happening, and I was still half asleep, but I realized one thing. It wasn't good. I raised my shotgun without much of a thought and fired around through the door. The way I figured, it was someone trying to knock in my door, probably to rob me or something like that, and that meant they were on my land and had no right to be there and every right to be shot. I live on private property, and I can assure you that you can't miss the many signs that read trespassers will be shot on sight. Upon this point though, I would never really met anyone stupid enough to test that. Now I figured having blown a hole through what was left of my door that someone was probably on the other side in pain and potentially bleeding out. The first thing I did was call the police. The next thing I did was try to open my door, but it was half beaten in and a bit warped. When I went to open it, the thing practically fell off. I was in shock because I thought whoever did that must have been quite strong. I saw the deep marks in the door. It was the same claw marks, and I went white with fear. I jumped back from my door and held my shotgun at it. I then waited for the police. They said it must have been a bear attack or something. I explained to them I had seen a lot of things in my lifetime, but bears don't leave marks like this. Still, I couldn't rule out it was some kind of an animal, so after filing a report with the police, I spent the rest of the night with my gun at my side while sitting in my rocking chair in front of the door. I didn't sleep a wink that remainder of the night. I can't say what time I, I was awoken, but I was shocked awake and the trauma from it all began. If you've ever been traumatized, you'll understand what I mean. If not, just know it can screw with your head. When morning came, I called in for the day from work, got a new door, reinforced everything, and then spent the rest of the day snoring after eating a quick meal. When I woke up again, it was nighttime. I knew at this point I needed to try to sleep, or my sleep pattern would be screwed, and so I attempted to, 
but when I would, I would be brought back to the night before, and I'd be hearing loud bangings and shots. It was then I'd find that nothing was there, and nothing went on. When I finally fell asleep, I was awoken the next morning to knocking at my door. It was one of my buddies and neighbors from several miles away who'd come to visit. I explained to him everything that had happened, and he brought up a story about something on his own land that had been eating his pigs. He was a farmer, and how one night he found himself firing at it. He said he wasn't sure if he had ever hit it, but the shadow of the thing must have been at least 12 feet tall. He hadn't seen it since, but a few others around town had heard some strange things, or had some odd run-ins with this creature. The town was pretty small at the time. It was a subject you simply didn't bring up. After my visit with my buddy, I tried to situate myself into a normal wake-sleep cycle again by spending the rest of my day attempting to relax with some reading and a bit of television. Day went by fine. I fell asleep relatively easily that night, probably from pure exhaustion. It took no time at all for me to wake to the sound of scratching on my walls. I listened more closely and I could swear something was slowly dragging its claws along the side of my house, and at times, seeming to try to quickly scratch the walls. It was strange, but I got my shotgun and went to look around my windows. This didn't go well, however, as the moment I went peeking around this thing appeared quickly in front of my window. Its face was just about the size of my window, and it snapped at me. When it did, it shattered my window and began to try to come into my home. I remember firing several shells into it and running upstairs to my bedroom, where I locked myself inside, called the police again, and reloaded my shotgun, ready for one hell of a fight. I was freaking out as I had heard this thing running through my place and trashing things. I heard it sniffing around, and once it hit the stairs, I swear I heard it leap over them in one bound. As if that wasn't scary enough... I could hear this thing smashing doors down all the while I waited in a corner, begging dispatch to hurry the hell up. Things got quiet before the sudden smashing of my bedroom door, which felt like it was a toothpick. This thing came in, and through the moonlight I could make out its massive size and some of its features. It looked like a dog or a wolf on two legs. It was at least 12 to 13 feet tall, and that was hunched over. It had these huge claws. Its teeth looked damn near the size of my forearm, and I remember shaking violently. I felt faint and terrified for my life. I huddled in a corner as this thing came closer. Then I heard a sound I will never forget. Sirens. They were loud and this creature turned for a moment distracted by the sounds. I remember firing a couple of shots and trying to run. This creature took a swipe at me and missed, but charged me right after. I was hit with a heavy force and lifted from my feet and through my window. Now, the second story isn't terribly high up, but it definitely hurt when I landed. I remember rolling and the sound of my gun going off as it hit the ground next to me. The police rolled up and someone checked on me as I pointed toward the bedroom. When I heard a loud stomping and another window breaking, the last thing I remember was my shaking. I had peed myself as well, but you would have too if you lived through that. I kept repeating. It's not a bear. It's not a bear. It's not a bear. Over and over again. I wanted to stop saying it, but I just couldn't. I think I was in a mild shock. I stayed with family a few times over for a couple of weeks. Now I used paid sick time during this time and reevaluated my living situation. I ultimately decided to stay put. I wound up rigging up my home with every possible security measure I could afford at the time. I've never seen this thing again, though. I'm not sure if it was the couple of weeks I took away, or the police ambush, or what stopped it from coming back. Maybe it simply moved on. Maybe I just got lucky. Now I'll never forget my experiences, so long as I live. In the Dead of Night by Swamp Dog The call in the dead of night jolting me awake from a restless slumber. My heart raced as I fumbled for the phone on the nightstand. My eyes were squinting against the harsh glow of the screen. Detective Nakamura? I mumbled groggily. Detective, it's Chief Tanaka. We've got another one. Chief Tanaka's voice was as stern as ever. 
but an undertone of anxiety permeated his words. My mind struggled to shake off the cobwebs of sleep. Another what? We were dealing with baffling disappearances of young girls, and the most recent one was a young girl named Amiko, only a few weeks ago. She had been hiking with her friends in the dense forest of Akigahara, notorious for its eerie reputation as Japan's suicide forest. Amiko was never seen again, and despite extensive search efforts, we found no trace of her. What's going on, Chief? I asked, my voice now tinged with concern. Uh, another girl's gone missing, Detective. Chief Tanaka replied, his voice cracking slightly. Her, her name is Yumi, and she was hiking with her friends in the same area as Amiko. My heart sank. Two girls went missing quickly and in the same cursed forest. I knew I had to act fast. I'm on my way, I said, reaching out for my coat. Akigahara was a dense, primeval forest at Mount Fuji's base, known for its thick, tangled undergrowth and an eerie silence that hung like a shroud. It had long been a place of dread and superstition for the people of Japan. People whispered of evil spirits, vengeful yuri, and overwhelming senses of hopelessness suffocating those who dared to enter. As I went to the forest, the moonlight cast an eerie shadow on the road ahead. The stories crept into my mind, but I pushed them aside. My job was to find Yumi and bring her back to safety. Arriving at the scene, I was met with grim faces all around. Yumi's friends, still in shock, recounted their last moments with her. Like the forest whispers, they heard faint, mournful cries in the night. They said the trees seemed to move, closing in on them, making them feel trapped and disoriented. I began my investigation, carefully retracing the steps of the group. The forest. It, it was unforgiving, and every step felt like descending into a world far from what I knew. My flashlight barely cut through the thick canopy, casting eerie shadows on the twisted and fallen branches and roots. Hours turned into days and my search yielded absolutely no results. There was no sign of Yumi, footprints, discarded items, or anything to indicate her presence. As I delved deeper into the forest, my unease began to grow. The sense of being watched, of something ancient and evil lurking in the shadows, it was impossible to shake. On the fourth night of my search, Things took a turn for a very interesting worse. I had set up camp near the forest edge, hoping daylight would offer better visibility. The night was a symphony of eerie sounds. Rustling of leaves, distant hoots of an owl, and something unnatural. I sat by the flickering campfire, peering into the darkness, wondering what could be out there. That's when I saw it. An apparition. A pale figure gliding among the trees. My heart pounded as I drew my gun, my hands trembling. Wh who's there? I called out, my voice barely a whisper. The figure continued to move, its form ethereal, almost translucent. It beckoned to me, and despite every instinct telling me to flee, I felt an irresistible pull. I followed it deeper into the forest my flashlight beam illuminating the path ahead. The trees closed in around me, their branches twisting and snaking like skeletal fingers. The oppressive silence grew deafening. The apparition led me to a small clearing where the moonlight pierced through the canopy, revealing a ghastly sight. There, suspended from the trees were the lifeless bodies of Amiko, Yumi, and others. All the missing girls who had ventured into Akigahara, their eyes were wide open, filled with terror and their mouths agape, in silent screams. I stumbled back, horrified and sickened by the gruesome tableau before me. The apparition turned to face me, its mournful eyes locking with mine. It spoke a haunting whisper that seemed to come from the forest depths itself. Oh, yeah. 
are the forest guardians. It's sad. We take those who do not belong. I could feel the forest closing in on me. Its malevolent presence overwhelming. I knew that I was trapped just like the girls before me. And so as the forest's newest guardian, I remain. My soul forever bound to the cursed woods of Akigahara, where I will watch and wait, taking those who dare to enter, lost in the endless sea of trees and shadows. An Unidentified Creature by Matt S. Hello, Swamp Dweller. I absolutely love listening to your videos while I'm at work. I drive big trucks for the mines up in Sudbury, Ontario, and spend all day listening to your stories. I have one of my own and finally decided to share it. My name is Matt, I'm 30 years old, and I am an avid outdoorsman and spend most of my time hunting, fishing, foraging, and camping. This encounter still haunts me, and I still get chills whenever I drive on that stretch of road. A few years ago, while still living in Espanola, Ontario, when I was about 22 years old, I was on my way to go deer hunting at the end of October. I was traveling on Lee Valley Road, heading toward my favorite hunting spot. It was a cool, brisk morning with dew covering the tall grassy fields and fog on the windshield. It was a late start to my hunt as the sun was just coming over the trees and starting to burn off the morning chill. As I rounded the last corner, coming up to the small landing strip made for personal bush planes, I noticed something black in the field about 25 yards off the road. Thinking it might be a bear, I slowed down to get a better look at it and possibly take a short video to add in for the hunting video for my YouTube channel. As I got about 50 yards away, it turned to face me and I noticed my windshield was fogging back up. Clouds randomly appeared over the trees in field area. This thing stood up on its hind legs. Still thinking this thing was a bear, I stopped and hurried to get my camera. As I rolled down the window, it let out a blood curdling growl that sounded like it was right inside my truck. Bear and mine, I'm still approximately 30 yards away. I quickly noticed its face and body were not that of a bear. Its head was narrow. Its nose was shorter than a bear. It had taller ears, deep, amber eyes, and sharp teeth. Assuming as it did not get to see it close enough, its fur was messy, dark brown, and matted. Similar to a wolf, it had a short tail, probably about one and a half feet long. It had long front arms like a human, though it was covered in that same fur. The back legs resembled that of a dog, and it had a very obvious hawk ankle. No discernible human features aside from it standing vertically and being able to walk and run bipedally. I dropped my camera and reached for my rifle case as it sniffed the air in my direction got my rifle raised and loaded my 308 caliber round. I, I was about to fire. As I did, aiming center mass, I noticed that I got a direct hit. Though it was not a lethal shot, it ran off screaming like something between a dog and a bear. I got a second round, racked and fired again, missing as it was moving incredibly fast and dodging side to side as if it knew what was going to come for it. It ran to the woods and out of sight. I called a buddy of mine that I was supposed to be hunting with and I told him to meet me where I was. Now on high alert and with an extra set of eyes and a second rifle, we began to scan the trees as we walked into the field where it was standing when I shot. Unbelievable. We found fur and blood. We are both very good at tracking animals and collecting blood and skin. The hair itself felt very stiff and wiry. The blood did not really feel... I don't know. It felt like, almost more like engine oil in consistency. We called a friend who at the time worked for the Ministry of Natural Resources. He came to our location and assisted in tracking this thing down. We're still looking for it though. 
he got the hair and the blood and apparently he's gonna test it to some sort of you know some sort of lab that they have but he's pretty sure it's just gonna be a simple case of misidentification though you know how the government is he called me two weeks later to inform me the results came back the fur was apparently some sort of cross between some bear DNA and a canine. The blood was inconclusive as the DNA could not match any other in the system. Thinking about it, none of us could find any footprints or evidence in the soft soil either. I've since traveled that road as little as I can. I'm just nervous now, you know? I think I may have seen it at least one other time. My MNR friend, hunting buddy, and I rarely talk about that day. But when we do, we always have the hairs on our necks raised as if something was nearby or watching us. Thank you for listening. Hopefully someone here will have a little bit of better idea of what I saw and can give me an idea of exactly why and what it wants. The Beast in the Refuge by Anonymous I was camping at Hart Mountain Hot Springs. It was around 6.45 a.m. I left my campsite on foot to use the nearest restroom. The campsite sits above a field overlooking the road that runs west to the other campsites, a field, a creek, and the three hot spring pools. I was walking out of my sight. I saw an animal crossing the area. It was probably 200 feet away from me. You know, at first I thought it was just like a wild horse. But there were no wild horses in the Hart Mountain National Antelope Refuge. The animal's body, it was facing me towards the south, with its head slightly to its left. I thought it was a horse because it had a black mane of hair, and its body was brown and shiny. It appeared to be about the size of a yearling at first. I say at first because later I saw a human man in the exact same location. There's a path there from the west campsites that travels to the parking lot by the east camps. And I now believe that the creature had to have at least been eight to seven feet tall. It turned its head right directly toward me, and then its body turned leftward toward the east. It walked across the parking lot toward the bridge across the creek and I lost sight of it in the trees. It was bipedal. It did not move quickly, walking with its back slightly forward and arms swinging at its sides. I later looked at footprints. The ground was hardened to find any. I crossed the bridge and walked a little up the creek, which was north, looking for any evidence like hair, but I could not find anything. If anybody listening to this has any idea, please let me know in the comments down below. Running is the best option by Satan's Panic Attack. I'll start by stating that I haven't always lived the best life. I've made many dumb decisions that have led to me being in sketchy and dangerous situations such as the one that I'm about to share. However, it's also because of this that I'm always paranoid and prepared enough to face them. Rarely I run away from danger and I always have protection on me when I leave my house. This will be relevant later on in the story. This happened back when I was roughly 19 years old. My best friend and I were practicing witches at the time, and on this particular night, it was the beginning of a full moon. There were some thickly wooded areas in the small college town we lived in that they were well known for being secret hangout spots for college kids and high school kids and the like. It had a sizable, secluded clearing at the end of a forked hiking trail that was only accessible after crossing through a park and two wooden bridges. Imagine a wishbone shape with a clearing at the far end. We thought that this would be the perfect place to set up shop and do some scary witchy rituals as we had been there plenty of times before and we knew both sides of the trail decently well, even in the dark. So we pack our supplies in her milk crate and head to the park. After parking, we walked from the parking lot to the first bridge. On the way to it, you have to pass by an outdoor theater that usually is wholly empty other than the occasional group of college students not wanting to make the 30 minute walk out to the clearing. But this time, there was a man I had never seen around town. He appeared homeless due to his dirty and weathered clothes, a bicycle leaning against a wall with bags of junk hanging from it, and a basket stuffed with more trash on the back. He was sitting on the stage of the theater with his back to us and his face in his hands. A homeless man hanging out in a park may not sound odd, but 
This was a tiny town, and homeless people were noticed when there were ones here, which wasn't very often. Since his back was turned to us, we figured we could slip away without him seeing us, so we did, and continued our hike to the clearing. We got there without issue and began setting up as the full moon was almost overhead. We started our work, and I let her go first so I could double check the perimeter to ensure we were safe and alone before coming back to sit with her and watch, but still listening for any sound for animals or lurkers. Then I heard rustling from the direction of the trail side we had come from. I jumped up, flicked out my pocket knife, and turned to face whatever had made the noise. From our spot in the clearing, it was about ten feet from the dark trail ending, but the moon's light was just enough for me to catch a glimpse of something quickly ducking under some sort of brush. I quietly whispered to my friend that I had just seen somebody, and start to pack up our stuff. She looked at me wide-eyed, and as I did so, she kept her eyes trained on that spot. Then, we heard something else come from the woods, and she picked the crate up immediately. It was a quiet but stern laughing. I shouted at the sound that whatever it was needed to F off, and that I was armed but whoever was watching laughed even louder. Finally my friend started to panic and hissed to me that we needed to go, but the only other way out of here was on the other side of the trail which we didn't know too well. The sound of more twigs snapping and rustling as whoever it was started to come out of their hiding place made up her mind, and she took off towards the other side of the trail. As she did I heard the tearing of more brush like whoever it was was trying to fight its way through the dense area to cut her off. Her safety is my biggest priority. I followed after her, but when I started running the noise got quieter. Not gone, but like the person was taking their time getting through. We'd made it a quarter mile down the trail, hearing the occasional twig snapping or brush rustling along the way. Before I turned my phone's flashlight on so we could hopefully get down the path faster without tripping, a few minutes after I did, there was suddenly stomping behind us like someone was booking it towards us. I spun around ready to defend us, light still in hand, and that's when I finally got a good look at her pursuer. It was the homeless man from before. His face looked dirty and beaten up, but his eyes were what shook my bravery. It was entirely clear he was on some sort of substance because his pupils were almost the size of his irises and his rotted teeth were bared and clenched together so tightly it looked painful. He stopped dead in his tracks and ran back toward the clearing after the light hit him, which was my cue to do the same toward the park. After that we ran as fast as we could and only stopped for breath when the bridge came into sight. We breathed a sigh of relief. That man didn't seem to have chased us the rest of the way. Still, as we crossed the bridge into the artificial light of the park, we looked back and saw his junk-packed bike half covered by a tarp and dead brush thrown over it as if he was trying to hide his presence from anyone else who would be passing by. She ran ahead of me across the bridge and towards the car, but I continued to stare just a little bit longer. I swear I saw his face peek out from the trail with a massive grin on his face that sent a shiver down my spine. I raced after my friend. We dove into the car and whipped out of there like bats out of hell. I looked back and saw a dark silhouette standing on the bridge. We called the cops to report what we had seen, leaving out why we were there, and they said they would send a car out to investigate, but we never heard anything back from them, and thankfully we never saw that man again. Be safe when you're out there on trails, my friends. Hometown Murder by Pepper Four. This isn't a paranormal or a wild animal encounter, However, as we know, the scariest things that happen usually happen by humans. This story is about an actual unsolved murder in my hometown that's 35 years old. I grew up in a small town in Tennessee, and being in the country with basically only five houses on our road and all being family makes this story even more alarming. I'm now a retired veteran of the Iraqi and Afghanistan conflict, so I've seen my share of horror stories. However, even being alive to join the military was luck. It was September 1987, and time for my town's yearly visit to the fair or carnival was here. It was Saturday night, and I had been hunting our property alone since I was nine years old. I had a friend we would call Twin. She was a year younger and lived across the family's 170-acre field and wood. Being that this was the 1980s, I had a three-wheeler. I'm lucky to have survived that, to be honest, but times were different. Twin liked to hunt. We'd sneak out, scout areas, and smoke our parents' cigarettes. So it's probably 1.30 or so, and I'm in my room, which is located in the basement. 
My mom and I lived about 200 yards across the pasture from my grandfather, so I would have to push my old big red three-wheeler down the road and come back through the gate about a mile down the road and go on a trail we used to pick up twin. So we are looking out, laughing, and doing what most country kids did back then. Finally, we went to our deer blind which are common today, but in the 1980s not many people had an enclosed shelter that could see the fields and the woods, but also had heat and kept the wind off of you. So, we went up into the blind my uncle had built. We're talking about the fair, the rides and things. Me being male and twin being female, our families always joked that we were boyfriend and girlfriend which got under our skins. We were talking, smoking, and just enjoying everything, thinking we're cool. When I hear walking, it's in the distance, but it's definitely walking. But, I look at Twin. I realize, this is not my uncle as he and my cousin have gone out of town. I asked if she thought her sister could have been around, but she said no, she helped her sneak out. That's when she questioned, do you think your dad found out? I shrugged, and we both got quiet. We saw two men talking and cursing. Shit, we got guys trying to hunt illegally. But it wasn't bow season yet, and gun season isn't until November. We watch a flashlight come within 20 yards of the blind, and right on top of where I'd been hiding my three-wheeler. What are they doing? Twin said. I'm not sure, I whispered. It looks like they're digging. This incident is why I never go into the woods without a weapon. Even until this day, we both saw when the flashlight hit... We both saw when the flashlight's beam hit one of the men they had a pistol. They aren't hunting. They probably broke into a house and are hiding stuff, Twin said. Maybe, I concurred. We sat and watched at the sky as it began to light up very slightly. They come toward us and we both go to the entrance of the blind, which is a hole in the floor. We cover the hole with the cover and sit on it. Be still, I said. We held our breath as they walked under us, and they never noticed either us or the blind. We watched as they stumbled for what felt like hours. You see that? said Twin. Headlights came on and the car went towards Mr. Canyon. And the car went towards Mr. Cannon. We hopped down and went over to see what they were doing. There, there's a bloody t-shirt. Gloves and a gas smell. And it looks like an empty box of matches. They killed the deer, we thought, and tried to hide. Hunting was definitely not in season. Assholes ignored the private property signs and everything. But I saw something else. Gloves and some white powder in a bag. I, I think that's drugs. Maybe they are, I said. I, I've never really seen anything at that point in my life to know, and I don't do drugs now, so I'm still unsure, but if I had to guess, it was likely some sort of coke or something. We grabbed the t-shirt, gloves, and pack and took off. I dropped Twin off and speed across the field home. I got home and woke my mom up showing her what we found and explaining what happened. She called the police and it took about three and a half hours for them to even get there. Where did you find this? The cop asked. In our woods, I said. I took the officer to the tree and began, and they began digging and found three large bags full of cocaine. One of the men looked at me. You're lucky, son. How did they not see you, but you saw them? I was actually in our hunting blind, I said. I showed them where it was. And they said, no wonder they didn't see you. You're very lucky. They murdered two people and stole drugs and money. I felt sick. They were hiding the evidence. Do you know them? No, I really don't, I told them. After that, they left. There were no leads, no nothing. It ended up being a girl on our bus's dad, and apparently he was dealing drugs. Although we would still sneak out after this event, we would always be much more cautious. And even to this day, like I said earlier in this story, I still carry a weapon no matter where I go outside. But especially in the woods. Overall, it is a sad story, and maybe one day Swamp Dweller can make a documentary on it. The victim's name is Danny Wells and Julia Twink. I hope they solve that case. What's up, Swamp Folk? I hope you're ready for today's story. It's the epitome of camping trips gone wrong and definitely on the darker side. So nothing we aren't used to on this channel by now, but it may have some of you thinking twice about where you spend your next family outing. Today, we're heading to the Maquoketa Cave State Park in Iowa. It's 370 acres, including a six mile hiking trail which connects all 13 of the park's caves. While it is described as breathtaking, the tragedies that have taken place here are absolutely heartbreaking, senseless, and downright perplexing. 
Some of you may remember the headlines as it was fairly recent that this went down, but I'm talking about the grisly murders that claimed the lives of three family members. Though the Makokota Cave State Park murders are not what state officials would call quote unquote unsolved, the case at times definitely feels incomplete. Important information has yet to be released, some of which may never be made public despite its relevance to fully understanding what may have actually happened here. What happened to the alleged killer? They too would later be found dead, and upon learning the attacker's identity, the mystery would only deepen, and the big question has still remained. Why? Why did any of this happen? Well, I'm going to attempt to tell you why. First, we need to start with the Schmidt family. The Schmidt family was from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, 60 miles west of Makokota Cave State Park. Before moving to Iowa in 2018, Tyler Schmidt was an IT software engineer in Lawrence, Kansas. Sarah Schmidt, wife and mother, worked at Cedar Falls Public Library. The two met when fate brought them together for a monarch butterfly project where they quickly found that they had much in common, like the fact that they were both huge Jayhawk fans. They went on to get married and have two beautiful children. Lula was six years old and Arlo was nine when the family made their faithful trip to the Makokota Cave State Park, but in July 2022. What should have been a lovely vacation full of cherished memories soon turned into a complete nightmare when the unthinkable happened on July 22nd. A seemingly unprovoked, brutal attack left Arlo Schmidt as the only survivor. When news of this case first broke, it was not reported where the young boy was at the time of the murders, but authorities and Arlo himself later confirmed he was also inside of the tent with his family. The unthinkable happened in the early morning hours. Nine-year-old Arlo Schmidt woke up to his family being attacked in their tent. There was screaming, there was blood, and Arlo knew his parents were severely hurt. Miraculously, the young boy managed to escape the slaughter while the attack was still taking place. Wearing only one shoe, he ran 75 yards through the grass to the closest campsite, screaming for help all the while. Cecilia Sherwin her husband and her son were camping near the Schmidt family on that Friday morning, and Cecilia recalled hearing screams followed by two gunshots. As they went to investigate, a young boy ran up to them screaming that something had happened to his parents. A man in black had shot his family, and that's when she called 911. For several months, the public had no idea what transpired on that phone call. Then, through the Freedom of Information Act in January 2023, the 911 call was made public. It begins with Cecilia Sherwin saying, shooting, shooting, and adding that she was with a young boy who said that his parents were shot and there was blood. Arlo can also be heard saying, I don't know if they were shot, but it was scary. Jackson County 911, where's your emergency? Marcatitza Caves. Uh, Marcatitza Caves? Yeah. Okay, what's going on out there? Shooting, shooting. Cecilia would then make a correction to the dispatcher, who then phoned the park rangers before returning her attention to Cecilia. She asked the panicked woman if she could speak directly to Arlo in an attempt to learn more. When asked, Arlo said, I woke up and saw someone in black clothes. They had a weapon and my sister was screaming. The dispatcher asked where his dad was and after a pause, the boy replied, I think they were hurt before repeating that the assailant had a small gun and wore all black clothing. The phone is then returned to Cecilia, and a few moments later, she could be heard asking Arlo, Honey, are you okay? What's wrong? Most of the conversation is pretty clear, but there is a point where the reception begins to drop out a bit, some words are completely unintelligible, and if you listen carefully, you can hear Cecilia state the following. He, Arlo, was screaming up there in the tent, and we heard shots, and then it goes unintelligible. He was screaming up there in the tent, but nobody would come out. Nobody would come out, and so we unintelligible towards the entrance, and so we unintelligible him away. Obviously, there's some red flags in that statement. Did Arlo run to the Sherwin's campsite, or did the Sherwin's, possibly Cecilia, approach the smidge tent and take Arlo away? Based on the two conflicting reports, there's no telling what actually went on. A park ranger arrived about 23 minutes after the 911 call was initiated. 
Arlo stated that he heard gunshots and Cecilia would later confirm with police and reporters that she heard yelling, followed by two gunshots just before Arlo ran to their campsite. Again, I don't know why she told the police something different on the phone, but I mean, maybe it was just the heat of the moment, maybe people were just freaked out, it's kind of hard to say. Authorities arrived at a horrific scene. Approximately 25 minutes after receiving the 911 call, they discovered three bodies, a family from Cedar Falls, Iowa, Tyler and Sarah Smid, both age 42, and their six-year-old daughter Lula, were all deceased inside their tent. Authorities immediately closed the park and a nearby children's camp, Camp Shalom, was evacuated and closed until further notice. While police verified the registered camper's whereabouts, all visitors were accounted for except for 23-year-old Anthony Sherwin, the son of the woman who first called 911. Several hours later, about a mile away from the gruesome murder scene, a fourth body was discovered. The missing camper, Anthony Sherwin, had turned a gun on himself. When the investigation first began, Cecilia and her husband did not know their son was dead or that he was the suspect police were searching for. It was not until August 4th that Mitch Mordvet, assistant director with the Iowa Department of Safety, released a statement confirming that Anthony Sherwin was indeed the murderer. It states, the known facts and circumstances and all evidence collected to this point substantiate that Sherwin was the perpetrator of the homicides and acted alone. Okay, what the heck? So what exactly did this investigation entail? Um, unfortunately, we really don't know. We, we don't know what specific facts or evidence they are referring to. We only know what bits we can piece together from interviews with the press. We don't know what led up to this, what, what precipitated it, Mortved said. Adding, the investigation has not revealed any early interaction between Schmidt family and the perpetrator. Sarah Schmidt's brother, Adam Morehouse, told Our Quad Cities, All we know is that this was completely random. Nobody in either's family knew anybody. We didn't know the suspect. The suspect didn't know us. We don't know of any interaction that occurred. It was simply, this individual woke up that morning and decided to pick a tent, walk into that tent where my sister and her family were sleeping, and they never even got the chance to wake up. Autopsies were performed over the next few days following the start of the investigation, and the results were shocking to say the least. It was discovered that Tyler had been stabbed and shot while Sarah only suffered from stab wounds, but Lola was strangled and shot. The Smid's small family community was shaken and saddened by the news, but today the couple is remembered as being dedicated to their family and loved ones. Colleagues said Tyler and Sarah had great hearts for the community, and staffers from Lula's school shared the young girl's tendency to have bright, curious nature. To this day, the only thing connecting the Smith family to Anthony Sherwin was the fact that their families happened to be camping near each other one night at the same time. Now, we need to talk a little bit about the suspect here. I don't like to give too much credence or too much attention to them, but this is rather important for this story. Anthony Orlando Sherwin was 23 years old and from La Vista, Nebraska, where he lived in an apartment complex with his parents. Cecilia and Joe Sherwin. The three of them had been on a camping trip for quite a few days before arriving at the caves on Thursday, July 21st. Upon arrival, the family set up the tent for themselves and one for Anthony. During the days following the death of her son, Cecilia Sherwin told the Omaha World Herald that the family refused to believe the news. Despite police reports, the Sherwins believed their son is innocent and a victim of homicide too. They claimed Anthony showed no signs of distress and made no indications that he would wish to hurt anyone or himself. La Vista Police Chief Bob Lawson told the newspaper that Anthony Sherwin had no history of criminal conduct, but he was very familiar with guns. Investigative sources told the Des Moines Register that Sherwin allegedly used a ghost gun in the shootings and on himself. According to CBS News, ghost guns are unregistered and untraceable homemade weapons that can be made with a 3D printer or assembled from a kit. The ATF has stated that these are significantly contributing to a rise in gun violence. Ghost guns can be produced for less than $200 and the average selling price as of April 2022 would be around $500 or less. Could Anthony have been some sort of gun fanatic? 
Of course. But, you know, you can't prove it. The Sherwin family initially advised police that they had brought a concealed weapon with them. They had a permit for it, but the gun itself was missing when the officials arrived, which was a bit strange, obviously. Police later determined that Anthony removed the gun from the secure case and made his way to the neighboring campsite with it. Later, his parents released an email to the Des Moines Register stating he built his own weapon. She went on to explain that they hadn't wanted him to purchase a gun, but they felt building one was a sensible idea given the level of crime around the Nebraska home. Now, before we move on to the exact statement the mother gave, it is a bit weird to encourage somebody to build a gun but not buy a gun. You know, I understand that sensibilities can be different in different areas of the country and the world even, but that's just a, I don't know, maybe I'm just thinking about it too much, but it just seems a bit strange to like encourage somebody to build a gun, especially an illegal gun, rather than just buying a legal one, especially as a parent. The quote that she gave was, He only had an interest in guns for a few months before he grew tired of it. By the time we even took our trip, he told us he was going to get rid of them. We were relieved as we never owned a gun of any kind before this year. We only had one in the car on the trip. He didn't have a fascination as much as it was a challenge to build it, she wrote. She also maintained her belief in his innocent, adding, We are devastated by all of this and still believe our son was murdered. He had too much to live for to throw it all away like this. We think Anthony might have sensed trouble, grabbed the gun for safety. We refuse to believe the news. We are deeply saddened as he had so much to live for and gave us no indication that anything was ever wrong. So, do you think there's any truth to what Cecilia is saying? Is it possible that Anthony wasn't the killer after all? For what it's worth, the police certainly believe he's responsible. I suppose it depends on how much you're willing to trust their word. It is interesting that none of the evidence has ever been made public, though, and according to the Sherwins, they haven't seen any evidence that suggests their son is guilty either. Now, there are alternative facts out there, as people would call them. Cecilia said her son was wearing green, not black, and she'd known this to be true because she'd handed out the last of the family's clean clothes the day before the shooting. She knew Anthony was wearing green shorts. Unfortunately, most of the Sherwin's requests for information had been denied or ignored. Her son's autopsy report was obtained independently, however, it only added to her overall confusion though. The original autopsy listed Anthony's clothing as being green, to the Sherwins, the clothing distinction is important because Arlo had been insistent that the person who killed his family was wearing black. But also, this is a nine-year-old who was entirely freaked the heck out in the middle of the night, hella dark. Can you really blame anybody for thinking that the person was wearing black because they likely only saw them in a silhouette? Another interesting discrepancy is that early reports state that the police found Anthony suffering from a single gunshot wound to the head, but according to Cecilia, her son sustained two gunshot wounds. She believes the first shot would have been debilitating and wonders how he would have managed to shoot himself again. The final unanswered question, the one that particularly pains the Sherwin family, is one that Cecilia believes could be easy to answer. Was the gun that her son supposedly used to end his life the same gun that was used in the shootings of the Smiths? In a recent inquiry, the couple asked the lead investigator whether a ballistics match had been made but they did not receive an answer. Now, I do need to mention public record requests have been denied. In 2023, the Quad City Times also filed requests for public records under Iowa's Open Records Law and the Freedom of Information Act. The request sought incident reports, investigative documents, crime scene summaries, and autopsy reports. And it was denied just as the family's request had been. The only reply they keep receiving is the records you seek are not public. Debbie McClung, Strategic Communications Bureau Chief for the Office of the Commissioner with the Iowa Department of Public Safety, it's a freaking mouthful, stated that they were not public records. She explained, We can share immediate facts and circumstances of this case, which are contained in press release links which I've provided for you. On July 11th, the Quad City Times reported that McClung was directly asked whether the gun used in the death of Anthony Sherwin matched the one used to slay the members of the Schmidt family, but she again did not respond. Other controversial statements include one from assistant director Mordvet just before the Schmidt family autopsies were released. He said, Investigators are aware of a possible motive, but will not release it publicly. 
Police have declined to answer any questions and have not publicly released any additional information since August 4th, 2022. Now, in conclusion, for the Sherwins, the most important question is, maybe, is it without a doubt that Anthony committed these heinous crimes against the Schmids? What evidence has been released publicly or privately to prove this? If Anthony is not responsible, then who the heck is? Who is the man in black? Why is law enforcement refusing to release certain information, especially to the deceased's own family? What the hell was Cecilia saying on that 911 call? These aren't horrible questions to ask, but at this time, there aren't any answers to unequivocally satisfy all of these loose ends. The police say their evidence shows Anthony to be the sole perpetrator, that he committed this killing spree alone. So, who was the intended victim, and did he anticipate the family waking up? He must have. Regardless of his original intentions, there isn't much one can do to a family of four sleeping in a single tent without waking them. Had Anthony planned to murder the family quietly and for no other reason than to see if he could get away with it? Was he just desperate to try out his alleged ghost gun? While I was researching this and trying to think of a reason for someone to want to have an untraceable gun, it's hard not to immediately jump to like murder or drug deals or something more nefarious. But then why would he also need to stab the victims too? Or strangle a defenseless child? These are questions that are really hard to wrap your mind around and sometimes the human psyche is just something we really can't understand. In closing for this story, Rob Green is the Cedar Falls mayor, along with the Schmidt's friend and neighbor. He delivered a heartfelt speech in the center of the city's park. Framed photos of the Schmidt family were placed before the podium and more than 200 people attended the ceremony. There really isn't a whole lot of great news to report on something like this. It's also brutally, well, brutal. So we'll end with this. Arlo Smith is being raised by his parents' families, and he's reportedly healthy, happy, and loved. Sometimes the best thing you can hope for. Last year, a GoFundMe was created by his cousin, Beth Shapiro, and it had collected over $40,000 to help Arlo. The money is being invested towards his future education, and at the time of researching this case, it has accumulated well over $293,000. Well, Swamp Folk, that's going to do it today for this story at the Makokota Caves State Park. What did you think of these murders? Are you leaning towards any particular theory? Definitely let me know your thoughts down in the comments. I'd love to get a nice conversation going about this story. If you're still undecided like myself, I hope you found it interesting and maybe learned something along the way. If you didn't, hey, there's always next time. For now, I'd sure be appreciative if you stuck to our usual arrangement, slapped around that like button a little bit, subscribed if you're new because I upload brand new videos almost every single day, and be sure that you leave a nice comment down below because if you don't, Shrek is going to come and blister up my booty. So if you want me to be able to sit down for the next couple of days and record some stories, you know what to do. Rhode Island Sleepaway Camp by Anonymous When I was younger, I would spend my summers at a sleepaway camp in a small town in Rhode Island. During changeover weekends, my mother would come pick me up and we would stay at her friend's house where she would do laundry and replenish my snack supplies before taking me back to the camp. Her friend had a large house across the street from a historic cemetery. She joked that she liked living there because the neighbors were quiet. The original house was three stories and had one old staircase carving up through it through the den next up to the kitchen and into the third floor, which was being used as a kid space at the time. There were additions on the first and second floors and modern stairs on the side of the house. The modern additions were not haunted, that's for sure. But every one of my mom's friends and family claimed the kitchen in the old part of the house was indeed haunted by some sort of specter. That weekend, my mom slept in the den next to the kitchen, and I slept in the third floor slash attic slash kiss space. I am sensitive to the spirit world, at least I like to think so, but I also get scared easily. So when I went to sleep that night, I remember turning off a lamp before using the remote control to turn off the TV because I was much too afraid of the dark and wanted to not leave the covers at all. I wanted to be entirely covered when it was dark. I woke up the following day to the lamp shining down on me. I felt so guilty because I could have sworn I had turned it off. I hated wasting electricity. 
I told my mom about this while we drove back to the camp the next day. C suggested that it might have been her friend's daughter coming in in the middle of the night drunk and thinking she could crash up there, but I rationalized that she had her own room so it didn't make much sense. Then, my mother told me about what had happened to her in the night. First, they had been drinking wine and talking in the den before her friend made up my mom's bed. They got to talking about ghosts in the house. There was an apparition of a little girl who would appear in the kitchen rafters from time to time. As they were talking, her friend visibly blanched. She was looking through the door into her kitchen and she could see the little girl right then and there sitting in the rafters swinging her feet. Then they went to bed. The den had three doorways. The closed off former front door, the door to the kitchen, and the original wooden door with iron latch and hinges that led from the hole to the stairs that went up to where I was sleeping. My mom remembers feeling uneasy about that stairwell, closing that door and latching it. She awoke in the middle of the night to see the door opening and a shadowy figure of a woman standing in the doorway. She forced herself back to sleep, but the door was still available in the morning, wide open. She, she wondered if this, too, was the daughter coming home and not expecting guests. But again, all the family members lived in the new addition. She didn't have much of a reason to be where we were. We asked the daughter later and she denied being there. I think our presence stirred up something. In my memory, I can see the ghost going from the kitchen to the den up the stairs, wondering who these people were in her house. But of course, that is probably all my imagination. It had white dots for eyes by Trey B. Hello Swamp Dweller, my name is Trey and I have a story I want to share with everyone here. I live in central Pennsylvania and visit my grandparents in Baltimore, Maryland. I used to go the quickest way driving through a small community called Burnt Cabins. All you need to know about burnt cabins is that it gives me the creeps, and I hated going through it. Anyway, I was doing my monthly trip to Grandma and Grandpa's house a few years ago. I hung out with them for about two days before I drove home. I'd gotten about halfway there, and I, I was way later than I should have been, meaning I'd have to drive through burnt cabins at night. It was winter time, so I moved slowly in case of ice. While going through the town, I was trying not to creep myself out by the horrible vibe the place gives off when, from the right of my headlights about 30 feet away, this tall and very skinny, pitch black humanoid thing on all fours leaps into the road. I slammed on my brakes and came to a stop. I was glad there was an ice on the road, but this thing stared daggers at me. I remember it was very bony looking. I could make out its joints and vertebrae. This thing gave me the absolute creeps. It crawled up to my window like General Grievous from Star Wars and started tapping on the glass with his claw. That's when I knew this wasn't some guy in a black spandex suit messing around with me. It had no facial detail except for two tiny white dots where the eyes should be. No mouth, no nose, or anything else. After a couple of seconds of this thing tapping on my window, it started clawing at my window slowly but more aggressively, like it was trying to get in. Why, why didn't I just speed off? Who knows? Other than the screeching of its claws on the glass, it wasn't making a sound. To this day, I don't know what it wanted, why it was attacking me, or I guess seemingly trying to attack me. After a few minutes, it leaps out into the darkness like a giant demonic frog or something. I floored it off and drove having little to no regard for the speed limit. I got home and my wife could immediately tell I was shaken up. She sat by the fireplace and held me in her arms saying, it's okay, I got you, while kissing me on my head. It took me a while to calm down. I tried explaining what I saw, but I just couldn't talk straight. Needless to say, I did find a new route to Baltimore avoiding burnt cabins entirely. There was someone with us by Crazy P. Hello Swamp Dweller, I just wanted to share my encounter with what I think was a paranormal experience. I live in Romania, in a small town in the northeast of the country. 
A few years ago, back between 5th and 6th grade, my old teacher wanted to do a camp with the whole class as it was last year seeing her. We stayed at a hotel with two different buildings. Half of the class was in the old building and half was in the new one. Me and two of my friends, let's call them Sarah and Gabby, stayed all three in a room on the last floor and on the right of our room were four other classmates. The first few days were quite normal activities and pool days, we were at the start of summer. Somewhere between the fourth and fifth day things began to change. It was nighttime and everyone was in their room with their door unlocked for our teacher to come and check if we were asleep. Me and Gabby slept in the double bed while Sarah slept alone in a small one. She didn't want to sleep alone so she pushed it to the end of ours. We usually slept with the TV on because we feared the dark. It never had a signal so it was usually a casual white screen with many gray and black dots. Sarah asked if I could build something on a game as she was too tired to do it herself. I gladly accepted as I loved to make things. It was only me, her phone, and the TV sound. Gabby and Sarah were deeply asleep. I spent a few hours doing things on her phone until I got one of those creepy chills. I usually get them after I watch a horror movie or something. I started to get scared of the slightest things for no reason. I decided to stay awake for a little while longer until suddenly, Sarah sat in her bed and turned her head looking at me. I called a few times and she didn't react. Hello, my name is Sarah. My heart dropped as soon as I heard her talk. I just sat there, staring at her, incapable of saying anything. That was it. I started holding my breath, scared that any movement would cause her to do something crazy. She smiled at me, went back to sleep like nothing had ever happened. I hoped that that random thing she just did was because she was a sleepwalker or something like that. To escape that creepy situation, I put the phone on the table near the bed and turned around, facing the door and Gabby. I tried closing my eyes and ignoring the feeling of pure terror that caught me. Suddenly, I heard something else. Like someone was knocking on the window. The curtains were closed, so it was impossible to see who was there. Even if the hotels were in the middle of the forest, 10 minutes away from any city, there were no trees close enough to the hotel to make any noise like this. I gaslit myself into believing that it was one of the boys from another class, as I knew they all do these kind of jokes to annoy people. Of course, if it was a person, it should have been... It should have been somebody who was locked on the balcony or somebody who magically flew up to one of ours. After a few seconds, I heard the hangers in the closet moving as if someone was in there moving around. And I started to tear up because there couldn't be any wind in the closet to cause that to happen. I touched Gabby, hoping she would wake up and stay with me for a while, but she didn't. After both the knocking and the movement stopped, I finally calmed down. Well, I calmed down too soon. Behind my back, there was a small bathroom. We usually never closed the door in case one of us wanted to go in the middle of the night and didn't want to wake up anyone with the noise that it caused. While staying silent, I started feeling steps going out of the bathroom near my bed. You know that feeling when your parents walk in the halls of your house and you know they're there because you can feel that, like, heaviness to it? That's precisely what I was feeling. It stopped right near me as, a, as if it was like examining me, you know? I don't even know how to explain this. Still, with my eyes closed, I faked turning around in my sleep to face the bathroom, and I shouted in my head multiple times to slightly open my eyes to see who it was. I knew there was no way it could be a human, but I prayed that in some way it was just somebody playing a prank on us. There was absolutely no one there when I opened my eyes to see who it could be. Absolutely no one. I started to panic, and you know, as a child, I pulled the cover over my head and went back to sleep thinking it was safe. Somehow, I did eventually fall asleep and the following day, I woke up and told my friends what had happened. Sarah said she did not wake up, so she said it could have been some sort of sleepwalking moment, but she never had one until last night, at least that she knew of. Gabby said that everything that happened to me, she felt it too, so now I knew there was no way for it to be a nightmare. One of the girls next door in our room looking for something looked back at us with her eyes wide open and said she heard everything too. Now I'm in the 10th grade and to this day I still don't know what happened that night. Whenever I'm at my house or a friend's house, I always close the door to the bathroom. I'm sick of hearing people say that maybe I dreamt about it. Other people felt it too. There was no way it was a dream.
Don't Follow the Faces in the Mist by S.F. Sundown. Don't Follow the Faces in the Mist. It was a throwaway line, but one I should have listened to. We had finished up a block of training and our instructor, a wiry man everyone called Buck, invited us out for drinks. Most of the group joined, but a few stayed along. A lot of them were locals and had places to be. I was happy to have the company. As the night wore on, Buck's stern exterior came down. It is common enough to almost be a rule that sternness comes from a place of care and concern. Though sometimes misplaced, it was not so with Buck. His job was to prepare us for what we would face in our field and provide us with the tools to execute it as rangers. And he took it seriously. I was happy to have him as a teacher. At the end of the night, we said our goodbyes. He slapped down a hand on my shoulder and took in a breath. He lifted his head with his drooping eyelids and looked at me with a sustained intensity that shook clear the clouds of drunken mind. He said, The Smoky Mountains are a remarkable place, but promise me one thing. Don't follow the voices in the mist. It took me five years before I discovered why. The call came through in the early afternoon. A kid had wandered off from the campsite a few miles down the road from the ranger station. The situation is common enough. Someone had wandered off and couldn't find their way back or had managed to get themselves stuck. The majority of these calls resolve themselves the same day. We find the person and issue stern warnings. Hell, sometimes it is all over by the time we even get there, but not always. And no one in our station needed any reminding. Posted on the notice board beside the front door is a picture of Jessica. Her photo has been there for the entire five years I have worked at the station. She went missing the summer before I started. She is still there because we never found her. Jessica's father insisted the photo stay until she was either walking back out of the forest or the alternative no one wanted to give voice to. I know that photo better than any photo of my family or friends. Six-year-old Jessica with blonde hair spilling over her shoulders, fingertips poking out the sleeves of a red puffer jacket one size too big, a pair of bright yellow boots pushing up over faded denim jeans, and a big toothy open mouth smile. Her family took the photo the day that they arrived at the campsite. When the sun set on the search, her father had a copy printed and plastered all over the surrounding town. They were the clothes she had been wearing when she wandered off during the hike the family took up to the waterfall. The copy hanging on our notice board is the only one left. We pulled up to the campsite in our truck. A woman with a bright red beanie pushed down over dark hair was upon us as soon as we got out. She had her phone pressed to her ear and stuffed it in her pocket absentmindedly when she saw us. Adrenaline made her voice shrill and pushed her words together. Kyle nodded and added a few calm words to get her on track. His voice and manner are perfect for these situations. He didn't interrupt, he didn't raise his voice, he only slipped in enough words to get the information we needed. Her name was Polly, she was six years old. She had been wearing a red beanie like her mother's and had faded brown jacket on. It had been passed down through the family. She had dark brown hair and brown eyes, and where was she last seen? Well, where they were hiking was up to that same waterfall, and they planned to have a picnic up there. When they made it to the top, the mist had come in so thick they couldn't see anything of the view. That combined with the chill in the air convinced them to come back down. The four had walked together, mother, father, older brother Will, and Polly. She had been up there with them when they made it down. On that point, both mother and father agreed Will had shrugged his shoulders. At the campsite, the air was clear and the fall sun warmed our shoulders. Up the mountain could very well be a different story though, and it likely was. But they somehow left Polly behind the walk back. We got a vehement no. She came down off the mountain. Somehow, in the time between coming back down and setting up the picnic at the fold-out table beside the camper, Polly had wandered off. It wasn't like her, she was a good girl. As we listened, a small crowd circled us at the distance. Because it was the middle of the day, most of the campers were off walking a trail or sightseeing in one of the nearby towns. The ones that were around, elderly couples on retirement and families on holiday, picked themselves up off their deck chairs and came to see about the commotion. No one had seen little Polly, though. Kyle split us into two teams. The first was to search down and around the campsite, the most likely place she would be, at the back of the campsite, a tree-lined creek meandered down the mountain. Beyond the terrain was rough, grass-covered hills and gullies filled with thick bushes. If she had ventured out there, a slip could send her tumbling into a stack of reeds and no one would see her. The second team was to go back up the trail, retrace the steps the family had taken to come down. It was unlikely, but sometimes people had what Kyle called a McAllister moment. This is when a parent is sure their child is or isn't with them, and they are wrong. 
It is the sort of thing that leads to parents leaving their children in cars on hot days and famously a family named the McAllisters leaving their child home alone to stave off some would-be thieves at Christmas time. Mark and I ended up on the team heading up the trail. I'll admit I was a little disappointed. Like Kyle, I was sure Polly was somewhere around the campsite. It is a selfish thought, but on a search you always wanted to be the one who finds the person. I was sure now that it wouldn't be me. We started up the trail, leaving the campsite in the search effort behind. Before we left, the mother had shown us a photo of Polly taken up at the waterfall. I kept the picture in my head as we walked. I hoped we wouldn't be adding it to the notice board. The trail was eerily quiet. I had walked it many times and always come across people powering up or coming back down. Not today. The trees surrounded us on all sides, and the world went silent. We walked slowly, scanning through the forest on either side and calling out her name. We hadn't gone far when the mist came in, thicker and faster than usual. When you live up this way, you get used to it. There's a reason they're called the Smokies after all. Before long, visibility was down to only a few yards. I stopped and looked back down the trail. It was no better than the visibility ahead. It almost seemed unnatural how quickly and completely the mist had arrived. I was about to say I had never seen anything like it when Mark took the words right out of my mouth. It was comforting that it wasn't just me. No wonder the family had turned back. The ferocity of the mist gave rise to a terrible thought. Polly may be up here in the forest somewhere. It would be easy for a child to wander off or even to stop to fumble with a stray shoelace for just long enough to get separated from her family. The parents had been sure she made it down, but then there was the McAllister effect. I called ahead to Mark, who had walked on ahead. When I received no response, I skipped a few paces to catch up. As an adult and knowing the area as well as I did, there was still a moment of fear when being alone spiked in my stomach. I could only imagine what Polly was going through if she was up here all alone. Mark had stalled up on the trail ahead. He turned as he heard my footsteps and pointed out to the right. He thought he heard something. I squinted through the mist but saw nothing. He couldn't give me any other details only that something had caught the corner of his eye as soon as he was about to turn his head. I stepped into the trees and called after Polly. A few steps more and I stopped and listened. Nothing. Back on the trail, Marco was fixed in place. His face had gone pale. It, it moved, he said. What did? Th the mist. I turned behind and then back to Mark. I waited for a punchline or for him to break into a smile, but none came. Let's keep going. I found myself on edge. The mist enclosing us had a sudden menace to it. As we climbed it, grew thicker. I buttoned up my coat and against the cold it was like being high in the air and inside a cloud. We walked in silence. I called out after Polly half-heartedly. When I noticed Mark was no longer by my shoulder I stopped and turned. I strode back down until I found him standing like a statue. He shook his head at me. He wanted to go down. I grabbed his arm and told him we had to keep going. It was our job and if Polly was up here she was relying on us to find her. Mark is a big guy but at that moment he looked small and fragile. He looked up to the sky and then back to me. He nodded and we continued. Up ahead, the trail turned to the left. As we approached, the bend shapes started to appear in the mist. At first, I took them to be the outline of branches leaning over the trail, but as we came closer, the outline stretched and deformed like clouds changing shape under a high wind. The shape coalesced into something that vaguely resembled the outline of a small child. I blinked my eyes and refocused and it was still there. The outline of a child running away from us, around the bend in the trail. I broke into a run and rounded the bend, chasing after the shape in the mist. On the other side, there was nothing. Only a blank wall of mist like before. Had I just imagined it? Was my mind playing tricks? I turned to Mark to check if he had seen it, but Mark was not there. I ran back to the bend and rounded it again in the other direction. Mark? I ran a few more steps and still nothing. Mark? I called out again and again and again, but there was only silence. He was just there a second ago. He had been beside me when the bend came into view. I was sure of it. Or had he? We had walked in silence. Had he flaked, turned back, and left me alone? Surely not. Mark was a reliable guy. He wouldn't do that to me. Maybe I had a McAllister moment. But then, where was he? Mark? I called again and again. I ran 50 yards back down the trail and nothing. I stood with my hands on my hips, unsure of what to do next. I didn't want to walk back to the campground without Mark. I also didn't want to hike further up the trail alone. A pocket of warm air washed over me and back over my neck. It was as if someone pushed their mouth right up against my skin and exhaled. I snapped my head around and no one was there. 
I almost called out again for Mark and thought better of it. I took a few steps back up the trail towards the bend where I had seen the shapes in the mist. On my left where the rustle of leaves and a sharp crack of a twig snapped, I stopped and peered through the mist in the trees. Something in there moved. I leaned forward. A few feet above the base of a tree, a small pocket of mist turned into a circle. As I neared it, it coalesced into a face. The face of a child. A small girl. Polly. I jumped forwards and the face pulled back further into the forest. I called out to the girl and followed her into the forest. If she was up here, I had to look. I had to be sure. Soon, trees surrounded me. The mist hung as heavy around the trees as it had done on the trail. I looked left and right, searching for the face I had seen or thought I had seen. No, it had to have been there. There again, up ahead, the vague outline of a small girl. I put the picture of Polly back into my head so that I knew that it was her. Red beanie, faded brown jacket, dark hair and brown eyes. But as much as I tried to picture Polly, it was the other girl, Jessica, from the photo on the notice board that I saw. The blonde hair, the red puffer jacket, and that big smile. I couldn't shake the image. I followed the face of the girl in the mist. I skipped a few steps to catch up, but she disappeared. I stood panting a little and called out. And there she was, directly ahead, standing in a small clearing. Red puffer jacket and blonde hair, six-year-old Jessica. Six-year-old Jessica, who disappeared five years ago and was now here, still six years old. I squeezed shut my eyes and shook my head. When I opened them, she was still there, smiling up at me with that big, goofy grin. I trembled. This shouldn't be. It was Polly I was searching for, dark hair, red beanie. I'm looking for Polly, I said and immediately felt foolish. The child looked up at me, confused, and the smile was gone. She turned a circle on the spot, and when her face came back into view, her face was different. Not only was her face not there anymore, it was now dark, and she manifested a red beanie. It was Polly now, where it had been Jessica a second ago. Polly? I said. She made the same goofy smile as Jessica had in her photo. I shook my head and almost yelled at her. You are not real. This can't be real. The grin faded again and her mouth twisted into a grotesque snarl. Her mouth opened wide and then wider still unnaturally so and her crooked child's teeth morphed into razor sharp fangs. The moment before I turned to run I locked with the creature's eyes, yellow and menacing. I raced through the trees, desperately seeking the trail. I swung my head around, and in the mist, a wall of faces closed in from behind. I gave an involuntary yelp and forced myself to look away. When I finally found the trail, I turned and ran at full speed down into. When I finally found the trail, I turned and ran full speed down in toward the campsite. Mark, be damned! I didn't want anything to do whatever with whatever. Mark, be damned! I didn't want anything to do with whatever was hiding in the forest. I turned back and before I could process anything, I hit a wall in the trail and tumbled to the ground. It was Mark. I scrambled to my feet and Mark stared at me with eyes filled with terror. Did you see it? I didn't answer him. I grabbed him by the arm and started down the trail. We had to get down. Mark made a noise, a half laugh, half cry, and I turned and followed his outstretched hand. There, standing near the trees, was Polly. But it wasn't Polly. She stood there and watched us, with an arm held out, beckoning us into the forest. Don't look at it! I fixed my eyes on the trail ahead, trying to give myself tunnel vision. In my imagination, the faces sprung up again on each side. I covered my head and yelled at them to stop, and then as if someone flicked a switch, I felt the warmth of the sun on my face. I looked up and saw the blue of the sky. We were out of it. We slowed to a walk. When we came back to the playground, Kyle asked us if we were okay. He could see that we were shaken up. I didn't know how to explain what we had seen, so I told him that we did not find Polly. The team at the base had not found her either. I am convinced of two things. Polly went missing on that trail somewhere in the mist, and whatever we saw was not her. There is a second photo hanging on our notice board. Polly has joined Jessica, two girls taken by something lurking in the mist. North Dakota Horror by Andy J. This happened to some of my friends and me during the summer of 2021 after my high school graduation. I'm from a small town in North Dakota, and my buddies and I are the stereotypical rednecks of the city. You know, the type who drive loud trucks and is always armed somehow. We were doing what most teenagers do for fun in the Midwest, driving around and shooting signs. When we got low on ammunition, one of my friends, we'll call him Gary, recommends we check out this snowmobiling warming hut where he's experienced some paranormal activity. 
Now, my buddies and I are all Christians and are very religious, but we couldn't pass up an opportunity like this either because we were also buzzed or because we were just dumb teenagers with nothing to do. So we arrive at the old shack and sit in my other buddies, who will call him Larry, F-150 truck. We turn off the headlights and the dash lights and look and listen. Even though I didn't believe in the paranormal at the time and was skeptical, I felt reassured that I had my AK with me. It's important to note that it is hot for a North Dakota evening and extremely dark out. We were all content, feeling good, and someone in the back seat suddenly said it felt like we were being watched. After he said that, I flipped the safety off my AK and tried to be aware as possible. Then he shouted, Holy crap! In the most terrified, helpless voice I'd ever heard come out of him, he tells us to look in Larry's rear view mirror. What I saw was genuinely horrifying. In this rear view mirror, this glowing white figure stands about 7 or 8 feet tall. It's only about 30 yards away from us, peeking behind a tree. Larry immediately turns his truck on and throws it in reverse to get a better look, but just as abruptly as it had appeared, it was instantly gone. I fired a few rounds in its general direction, and immediately after I did, the air got freezing cold. After that, Larry floored it, tearing out of there like the Dukes of Hazard. We were all spooked to our bones, but one of my buddies, we'll call him Barry, says he saw nothing. Now, the white figure was terrifying, but the creepiest part is why Barry didn't see it when all the rest of us did. The Cage in the Wood by Yes, I'm Fluffy 99. At the time, I was a 20-year-old female who had just moved to a small upstate town. I had grown up in a slightly larger town about 60 miles away and just wanted a new start. I love camping and often go camping in the Adirondacks, but at the time, I hadn't yet made friends to go camping with, so I wasn't going to go into the real woods alone, if you know what I mean. Down the road from me, I had been walking around and found an area where the power lines cut through a wooded section. The power lines were perpendicular to the road. It was near a house, but far enough to the right to the place where I don't think anybody would see me if they were walking the trail that the power lines made. I'm not sure about other countries, but in the United States, they keep power lines clear in case of maintenance. So I wander up there, noticing how it's pretty deep woods, and how far I can get away from the house that I saw on the road, they couldn't possibly think I'm trying to break in. And then, bing, I get an idea. I could go camping up here. It's secluded enough to give the natural woods experience, but close enough to the road that I wouldn't be in danger of wildlife or anything like that. So, I do. I set up camp in this little clearing that I accessed by climbing the hill, following the power lines, then turned left onto what seemed to be some sort of deer trail. Deer are absolutely everywhere in New York. Then I came upon this lovely flat, grassy clearing. After clearing the dead wood away, I built my fire off to the side. I'm feeling brilliant and independent. It was creepy to sleep in the woods alone, sure, as I had always had at least one camping companion. But hey, whatever. New experiences build new skills, you know? I wandered further down the path the next day to see where it led. I walked for about an hour, and I can see some fields on the right. But they are in the distance, and there is a fence between the fields and the path. So again... I figure people can't be mad for me being here. Then I come across another path. Heading to the right, I follow it. A couple of feet in, it curves slightly and there's an old van to the left of the path. Well, that's strange. But it's about 1 p.m. near noon anyway, in broad daylight and the birds are chirping. So I don't really feel in danger. I go up to the van, which had been there for a very long time, clearly. It was like a 70s style make. It made me kind of think of Scooby-Doo. And there were overgrown weeds all around it. There are streaks of brownish red going down the side from the bottom of the doors. I looked in and saw what appeared to be an old bedding or something in the back, but it was all shredded up and the curtains in the windows were shredded as well. There was clothing strewn about. It looked like the clothing was from the 70s or early 80s. I still felt no danger per se. Snickering at the terrible fashions back in the day, I continued along the path for a short time until I finished rounding another slight bend. I stopped dead in my tracks, finally. My reptile sense went off, or whatever you call it. I wake the hell up, and it, it, I'm just, my head is screaming at a total volume that I've never heard before. Up ahead, there is this creepy-ass doll hanging from a tree by its neck with a noose. Not just stuck in the trees, but just left there as it was hanging. It was terrifying, to say the least. 
To the right of it though, there was this huge cage-like structure, easily big enough to hold a full-sized human. It seems to be made up of pipes and other long metal objects, just welded together. Some were up, some were down, some were across, and the squares they made weren't big enough to fit my head through, let alone anything else. Not that I tried, anyway. It had four sides and a ceiling. It had other creepy-ass dolls hanging from it. It also had reddish-brown stains running down the sides, just like the van. Further behind it in the distance was a rundown house. Creeped out as hell, I just turned tail and ran. I am not a runner by any means. I am a chunky girl, and I have smoked for more than six years, and I do not run. But I ran that day. I don't even remember the run, and I remember coming up upon my campsite, grabbing my tent in one swoop as I ran past. Luckily, I had put all my things into the tent. Ripping it out of the ground as I continued running, I left my cooler, my food, and all that stuff behind. I never went back for it either, and sometimes I kind of feel bad about that though. I dropped the tent stakes along the way and had to repair rips in my tent. I tore down that hill. I'm still surprised it didn't break my neck or ankle. Jumped in my car and sped home. I locked all my doors, then paced my house going, what the hell, what the hell, what the hell, for hours. It's been 11 years since that incident, and even typing it now makes my hands shake. I currently live almost 1,400 miles away, but I still made sure my doors were locked, and they are. The crazy thing is, is I wasn't even that deep in the woods. Maybe in the 1970s it would have been, who knows. As it stands now though, people live within a short walk of this place. And no, I know you will ask, I did not call the cops. I can't articulate why. My best analysis looking back is that I didn't want the creep to find me. I should have probably called them at the very least. You are probably right there. I hope it was an old crime scene and not some sick man who still keeps people in cages in the woods. Freaky Fishing Trip by Anonymous A couple of weeks ago, my cousin and his friend went out in our kayaks for a day of fishing and relaxing. It is early spring so it was our first time out this year. Being something we did, my cousin and I, not his friend, it was his first time out, almost on a weekly occasion, the last couple of years, the weather was really nice. The pond we went out on is called the Great Island Pond, aptly named for the two-acre island located directly in the center. On this island is an abandoned hunting lodge, from what locals have told me, it was used until sometime in the 1970s. The area has all new housing developments and neighborhoods, but this was a remote place back in the day. My cousin and I often stopped in our kayaks and walked through the house at some point during each kayak trip. It's a rather large house with three floors, a wraparound deck on the second floor, and an absolutely beautiful view of the pond and woods. Having been there many times, we know how everything inside is set up. Getting back to the story, we got out of our kayaks and explained the house and its layout, where to step and where not to step, to our guest and first-time kayakers. After we were through, we went up the stairs and into the kitchen, checking out the old well pumps and retro refrigerator. Not ten seconds into entering the house, we heard a loud walking or running sound from upstairs, and we all stopped and listened. It sounded like a person walking, or a large animal because it was very loud. There was no way a squirrel or a raccoon weighed enough to make those loud steps. We were a little freaked out, but being 320-somethings, we shrugged it off and acted like we were not worried at all. The next thing we did was cut through the parlor to get out to the front deck and show our buddy the tremendous outside view. While walking through the room, my cousin and I stopped and looked at each other. He asked me exactly what I was just about to ask him. Why is the door upstairs closed? The door had never been closed during any of the previous visits to the house, and it is something that we both noticed immediately. The place has no wind because all the doors are in permanently closed positions or are stuck where they are. We continued to the porch and hung out for just a couple of minutes, taking pictures and enjoying the view. We walk back inside to check the rest of the house, and as we walk back across the parlor, the closed door that leads upstairs flings open hard enough to leave a dent in the wall. We ran out of the house back to the front yard. We were all visibly shaken up trying to figure out how that could have happened. There was no wind that day, all the other doors were closed, 
and the door that opened was clicked shut when we first saw it. After about five minutes of deciding if we should go back in, we did exactly that. We went upstairs and could not find a single living soul, not even a scared animal. We were absolutely dumbfounded. It was an exciting and confusing pit stop during our most relaxing day. One other thing that happened to me recently was I was lying on my back in bed, trying to fall asleep to no avail. For some reason, I felt the need to open my eyes, which was never really happening to me before. At least not that I can remember. I saw this misty pattern moving across on my ceiling. It was black but had some colors in it. It was moving around in one general area directly above me. I had this weird feeling in my body as well. I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me, so I woke up my girlfriend, who was next to me, and asked if she could see it. She said she couldn't, but I was looking right at it. I closed my eyes and waited a few more minutes, opened them again, only to see the exact same thing. Eventually, I fell asleep, and I, I must have just brought it up to random people, because what could this be? Am I going crazy? I don't feel like I am, though. Maybe somebody in the swamp will know what I saw. The Mammoth Cave River by Book Length Thriller A few years ago, my friends and I went on a 45-mile, three-night camping trip and kayaking trip down the Green River in Kentucky, which runs above the Mammoth Cave System, the world's largest known cave system with more than 400 miles of surveyed passageways. We brought everything we needed in our kayaks, and one canoe. Food, tents, water filtration, etc. We camped each night on the riverbank when it started getting dark, and we found a level enough ground. The first night was rather uneventful, except to say that there is nothing like a wall of fireflies against a mountainous black tree line at night in the middle of nowhere. The second day, around sunset, after a long day of kayaking and baking in the July heat, we came upon a stream on the bank that opened up into a large ravine. As we discovered, the stream was a cave spring pouring cold blue cave water into a lagoon about 30 feet wide, and it was absolutely beautiful. The water was so profound that the blue water turned black after only a few feet because of the sand and the rocks. The lagoon had a long, sandy beach secluded by hills on either side and a tall, overhanging cliff behind us. It was beautiful and like an otherworldly place. While we were there, time felt like it was moving slowly. We decided to camp there for the night. The sand was soft, white, and very fine, ideal for ground sleeping. The place deeply frightened me, but I didn't speak up. We were all tired and everyone was having fun. We built a small fire and enjoyed the stars through the leaf canopy. Before everyone went to bed, I slept hard that night. Sometime around 5 a.m. I woke up to relieve myself. It was still fairly dark outside. I had the tent door zipper about halfway opened and had just popped my head out when I heard a loud and terrible scream. I immediately recoiled back into the tent and zipped it closed, and I waited. Near the dwindling fire, the cry came about 10 feet from my left. It was high-pitched, but not like an owl's screech, although I'm not ruling that out. It was a wretched pained scream that got lower pitched as it went toward the end. Being that we were in the middle of nowhere Kentucky, most likely it was some sort of fox or boar or maybe even a bird. Whatever it was, I laid awake for an hour listening. I heard absolutely nothing in return. Granted, we were on a soft beach, but I didn't hear a single twig snap or a leaf crinkle when whatever it was finally shuffled away. It was bizarre. At this time, up the beach and off to the side of the lagoon was a small, dry cave opening maybe three feet wide. I cannot say with any certainty that is where some sort of ancient cave-dwelling creature lives or whatever and decided to investigate our camp, but I somehow feel like it's connected. I fell asleep eventually, by the grace of God, and awoke the following day absolutely shaken. I asked if my friends heard the terrible scream, but apparently no one had. We pressed on down the Green River further. The third night, at dusk, we came upon a large rocky beach. We pulled our boats ashore and decided this would have to do, 
as we wanted to avoid going further downriver and risk being stuck on the water in the dark. The rocky beach was where the river split in two, and the middle formed a collection of pale rocks, tall grass, and dried out wood. A lonely pile of muck the size of a football field. The land mass was covered in jumping sand spiders and tiny frogs. Again, otherworldly. We set up camp, ate, and all went to bed around the same time. It was silent for about 20 or 30 minutes. I was asleep, as the others most likely were as well. Suddenly, my dream was interrupted by what sounded like a booming, loud, mechanical wooden beast. I awoke and shot straight up. It was indeed the loudest thing I'd ever heard. It sounded like a massive bulldozer tearing down a colossal steel and wooden building. Then came a boom, followed by this echo throughout the entire river valley. The animals shifted, the birds flew away, we were all awoken by the crash and yelling in confusion at each other in our tents. Silence followed outside our tents. No one was particularly willing to shine a flashlight toward the woods, and eventually we all decided it was just a falling tree and went back to sleep. The following day, I thought about it some more. It damn sure didn't sound like some sort of falling tree. I must stress it had a metallic quality and was projected purposefully. It almost sounded like a roar. In the morning light, we found no evidence of anything out of the ordinary, nor any prominent fallen trees that could have made such a loud noise. So we packed up, headed out onto the river one last time, and got the heck out of there. My friends and I still talk about that trip and all the weird things that happened. We did the same kayak trip a couple of years later, and nothing out of the ordinary happened. No mysterious forest noises, and to my disappointment, nothing more scary. The Scary Story with My Dogs by Clear Patient 4390 I've been a big fan of the channel for some time, and I never thought I would have a story worthy to send in, but recently, something reminded me of an incident of when I was around 13. It's easily one of the craziest and scariest experiences I've gone through to date though I try not to think about it. Although, if you are triggered by animals getting hurt, I suggest that you don't listen to this story and skip to the next one. Before I get into it, I thought I'd give you a little context. In the years prior, my mom adopted a little four-year-old pit bull mix rescue named Mabel. She's the sweetest, most playful dog you could ever meet and loves the company of other dogs. After about a year, she decided she wanted to keep Mabel company since she was working and adopted another rescue named Lola. We weren't sure about her breed, but her age and face structure were similar. She was overweight and slightly territorial regarding toys and food and things other dogs would like to do, but other than that, she was just a little couch potato. When we first got her, we tried to introduce the dogs to each other to avoid conflict slowly. At first, it was going rather well. So, after about a year without incident, they seemed to be okay around each other and didn't mind each other's company. At this time, my sister, my mom, her boyfriend, and his two kids took a trip to Florida, a small coastal town in the Gulf of Mexico. We would usually go to a beach house my family owned, but it had been destroyed during a hurricane, so we settled on renting a small home just 10 minutes up the road on the same beach. We took the dogs out because Mabel enjoyed splashing around in the water. One day, around three days and two hour week long trip, we were having a good time at the beach. Mabel's just sniffing around and Lola, a little overweight for a dog, is just nestled down into the sand next to my mom and her boyfriend in their chairs. I'm not so sure what I was doing exactly, but I just remember hearing the deepest, most guttural growl and then my mom screamed. I whipped my hat around to see the dogs snapping at each other and baring their teeth. Then all of a sudden Lola's jaws were locked around Mabel's neck and head area and she's not letting go. They're both deep growling. It was just the most intense situation I've ever experienced. I started rushing over to break it up, even though I had no idea what I could possibly do. Before I could get there though, my mom's boyfriend jumped in in an attempt to break them apart. Not wanting to hurt them, he attempts the wheelbarrow method, essentially lifting the dog into the air and turning them sideways onto their back, 
while in the mood to get them to release their bite. Meanwhile, I'm ashamed to say I was frozen in fear and my mom and sister were just hysterical. But thank the lord it worked, Lola immediately released her grip and let Mabel go. After separating, we checked to ensure they weren't hurt. Neither dog was really super hurt besides a few bites and scratches. Thankfully, there were no deep wounds or punctures. We still rushed them to a vet and they were both okay and sent home with some antibiotic cream and pain meds. The vet said that the territorialism was common for new dogs being introduced into a household, especially for those who are not puppies. We can partially blame ourselves for not keeping a closer eye on them, but we did think at that point they were pretty much acclimated with each other, but I guess you can never be too careful. They've got an excellent sisterly bond, from cuddling on the couch, sharing toys and all that good stuff. It's been a couple of years since this happened and it seems like they are now friends. It still astounds me how quickly dogs' primal instincts can kick in though, take over their body, and they forget all about the happiness and fun times and it's all about the red. I know this might not be the typical horror story you share, and maybe it's not a horror story at all, but I did want to share this with everybody in the swamp. Weird Experiences by Midday Moon I experienced what I can only imagine is an otherworldly occurrence when I moved to the Sierra Nevadas about four years ago. I had been living in the South Lake of Tahoe, California area for, for many years and spent a decent amount of time in the outdoors, hiking, camping, and generally enjoying the beautiful place I was lucky enough to call home. Now, I don't get scared quickly. I'm used to being by myself and I carry weapons everywhere I go. Being a 5'2 and 110 pound female, I go out of my way to be sure I can protect myself. Many people in the outdoor community told me about being careful on the trails in the forest. I usually do these things alone save for my trustworthy though somewhat cowardly dog, but I had never felt as uncomfortable, confused, and downright afraid as I did in my apartment one night when I finally relocated away from Tahoe to Reno, Nevada. I had moved to Reno to escape the isolation of living in Lake Tahoe, and though it is only about 60 miles away, it felt like a whole different world. Now the city itself isn't necessarily huge, and I was living in the north end of town, surrounded by high desert foothills and somewhat sparsely populated compared to more of the urban city center. Still, I never felt like I was out in the boonies or anything. I lived alone with my pop and we liked our little apartment. So to set the scene here, it was early fall and the sun was beginning to develop at a much earlier time of day, which was exemplified by the fact that the city sits in a valley, so sunset seems to approach much faster than in other places in northern Nevada. My apartment sat just above street level with a window in the kitchen next to my stacked washer and dryer that looked out into an alley, maybe about 10 feet above the small street beside the small fourplex building. It was dark outside and I was alone with my dog doing laundry. My apartment layout was an open concept, and the living room slash kitchen area was separated by a wall that had a vast space cut out into it so you could walk through and see each other. With the washer and dryer tucked around, and the aforementioned window to the left of that, with the openness of the space, the darkness outside, and the number of overall windows the apartment had, it almost felt like you were in a spotlight. If it was dark out and I had the lights on, it looked like I was living in a fishbowl or a terrarium. Anyone or anything could see right in. I made it a point to permanently close my blinds, save for the small window looking out to the alley. I didn't mind keeping those blinds open because I liked the fresh air, and someone would need a ladder to reach me if they had been determined enough. As I was removing the clothing from the dryer and turning to plop it on my couch to begin folding, I realized my dog was acting incredibly strange. He didn't want to cross the line, so to speak, from my living room to the kitchen, marked by a change from the carpet to tile. Though it was only a few steps, he seemed incredibly hesitant and began whining and burping out small, concerned wolves. At first, I just thought he was anxious. For whatever reason, he is known to be a bit of a weenie, but then out of nowhere, I sensed this immense and insurmountable feeling of dread and displacement. I turned my back to the washer, dryer, and small alley facing window. My dog sat facing me, almost looking past me and his apparent anxiety and frustration began to build as I was asking him what was wrong. He started barking a whole alarm bark at this point, and as soon as he did, the sense that someone or something was observing me took over me and caused my blood to run cold. My logical response was someone was just watching me through the window, 
the only window that has open blinds, and the only window that anyone could see me through. So in one fell swoop, I reached for the overhead drawstring for the light and turned it off and faced the window, confronting whoever or whatever was intruding on my life. As soon as the light clicked off and the room was dark, I saw what I could only describe as a perfectly round light about the size of a small cantaloupe directly across from me on the other side of the window. It didn't glow like a lamp or a light though. Its edges were perfect and it didn't hover or vibrate or even move. At this point, I was too stunned to move, and my fight or flight response had engaged so quickly that I had no time to recognize or rationalize what I was seeing. I was looking at this thing, and it was looking back. I felt cold and confused. My hair was standing on end. My heart was racing. My dog had gone into complete freakout mode and was jumping and barking and generally causing a stir in the living room, as he could see all of this as well. The light seemed to now realize that I could see it, and it looked as if it backed away or at least grew more diminutive in size. It had moved to the right of the window now. It flickered twice and then disappeared. It didn't buzz away or fly away and it didn't zoom out of vision. It was visible, not visible, and then just gone. As soon as I realized the light was not there anymore, I opened the window and poked my head out to see what was going on. Maybe someone was up at my window with a flashlight. Perhaps someone in the neighboring buildings had seen something and would be checking for themselves to try and solve this odd mystery. Nothing. Not a soul. And what felt like deafening quiet was all I heard. I closed the window. As soon as I shut the window, I hear a solid three knocks on the larger window out front by the living room. As I mentioned before, those blinds were closed and though from the outside looking in it's entirely clear, someone was home because the lights were on in that room. No one could know it was me alone in my apartment, right? I wasn't expecting anyone over, and it was too late for solicitors. No one had any reason to be at my house then, and I was not going to open that door. My dog had rushed to the kitchen as soon as the light outside the window had disappeared, and then he was in what I can only describe full-on defense mode. And my dog is an absolute wuss. I've seen him run from cats and get spooked by bags blowing in the street, and he generally stays by my side on hikes while we're camping because normally, he expects me to protect him. This pup seemed ready for war though. Hackles up, eyes alert, growling at the front window now. I stepped into the living room, grabbed my gun with one hand and keys with the other, and slinked back into the kitchen and out the back door to where my car was parked. I threw my dog in, started it up, and raced off to a restaurant across town where I ordered to-go food and ate in the front of my Subaru. We car camped in a Walmart parking lot that night, I returned to the apartment the following day, my laundry still on the couch with no apparent signs of anyone trying to enter the place. Everything seemed normal. I never experienced any disruption in that place ever again for the year and a half that I lived there afterward. I have no idea, to this day, what I experienced. It wasn't until I shared this story with some friends that I heard that knocking and the sense of being watched was somewhat common of a phenomenon to people who encounter skimwalkers. Skinwalker Encounter by Sky Glow Project Hello, my name is Heron, and I am a BBC Earth Nat Geo photographer and cinematographer for various documentaries including Ice on Fire for HBO and Leonardo DiCaprio. A few years ago, something extraordinary happened to my shooting partner Gavin Heffernan and me at Vermilion Cliffs in Arizona. We have privately told the story to friends, but didn't figure making it public would make much sense until a friend of mine sent one of your videos about Skimwalker Ranch, which echoed almost similar things that happened to us. Gavin and I have specialized in night sky photography, and have covered all 50 American states and Canadian provinces, spending full nights in most remote places. However, of over 1,000 of those nights, we spent shooting in... However, after spending thousands of nights out there shooting, we have never had anything like this happen. We made our way to White Pocket inside of Vermilion Cliffs, a fantastic collection of swirling white lithified sandstone. We decided to spend a night there shooting time lapses for a BBC Earth short film and were the only ones there that night. We set up our six cameras and let them roll and decided to get some sleep. We set a timer for 1am to wake up and move our cameras to different places so that we could shoot another set of shots. 
When I turned, I saw lights that initially looked like headlights, but made no sense as they were in the direction of the park, where there were neither roads or trails. I pointed it out to Gavin, and we looked at it for quite some time. The more it appeared that it wasn't headlights, but possibly a headlamp of a hiker. However, there were no trails in that area, and we figured perhaps a hiker got lost and was wandering around towards us, as they may have spotted us with their headlamps. We decided to stick around and wait, as we were worried it might be someone who might take our cameras. We looked, and the light was getting closer, and when it got close enough that it was bright enough to reflect the white rocks at some point, but then it suddenly stopped. We sat there and waited in nothing. A couple of minutes later, the lights were back but much further away, and there was no way a hiker could have backtracked a few miles in a matter of five minutes. That disturbed us enough that we didn't return to our tents but stayed there to sleep next to the camera. This was a bizarre event, but we would have shrugged it off if something hadn't happened the following night. We drove to another park and hiked into a famous rock structure area called The Wave. Only about 20 people are allowed in a day via a permit, so we figured if we stayed overnight, three miles away from the parking lot, we wouldn't get any lights flashing around from cars or hikers. We could shoot the night sky videos there. It's a highly dark area at night. You can barely see your hand in front of your face. We did the same as the previous night, set up cameras and slept with the alarm set to 1am. Unlike White Pocket, the wave is situated amongst canyons that are highly echoey, and you can very clearly hear even the smallest of rocks roll half a mile away. Footsteps or any other sounds are easily heard. When we woke up, we returned to where we had left our cameras and set up new shots. However, when I went back to the spot I had left one of the cameras, it was missing. We left it there in the dark with nobody around. I frantically looked for it all around and nothing. I suspected. I may have forgotten where I exactly put it, but I was fairly certain that it was there. I went to Gavin and asked him if he recalled where I put it, and he said he was sure it was where I was. We searched for it more, covering the whole area. Then we stood there, quiet trying to see if we could hear the sound of a camera shutter clicking somewhere in the dark, but there was nothing. We agreed to go back to sleep and look for it in the morning when suddenly a loud thud reverberated through the canyon. We pointed our lights and walked in the direction of the sound. It was my camera, fallen over. There was no wind, no sounds of animals we would have easily heard, and no people. The camera was still clicking, taking shots, something we also would have heard when we were sitting there earlier listening for sound. We were beside ourselves as to how this could have happened because we set up our tripod legs wide to anticipate a possible bump of the camera by just about anything. But in this case, the camera would have had to been pushed over or dropped by something. I remember Gavin turning to me and saying, I'm an atheist, but this one's making me wonder. Following morning, I dropped Gavin back at his car. He went toward Los Angeles and I went to the city of Page, Arizona, where I planned to do a night of shooting in the Waterholes Canyon. That's just underneath State Highway 89 and about 5 miles south of the town. Tried to put last night's event in the back of my head as I had to shoot alone this night. I was still in the Vermilion Cliffs area, but this was just outside the park and I was close to the town, so unlike the last two nights in a completely remote location, this was underneath a highly utilized bridge of a busy state road. I parked and went into the canyon to scout things out in daylight. I wanted to grab a shot of the bridge from inside the canyon, looking up at the night sky above it. As I made my way down into the canyon, hiking down a trail, I started to smell something strange. The closer I got to the canyon area underneath the bridge, the more I smelled it. When I got there, I spotted next to the bridge support structures what appeared to be a dead dog. I got closer, and it was clear the smell was coming from there. I then realized it wasn't a dog, but a coyote, and it was lying. Not as it fell from above, but as if someone had set it down. However, the disturbing part was that the coyote was missing its bottom jaw and its tongue, and it was sliced off, like it was missing. Not ripped off, but sliced off, with precision. I left and never went back again. I didn't think about this much until I watched your episode about Skimwalker Ranch, and now it's really making me think. Plagued? By Skimwalkers by Logan O. I would call this monster mania because this was the night and place where many southwest cryptids like to roam. This took place a year ago in Prescott, Arizona, on my uncle's ranch. This all took place in a two week time span. I will share week one with you now, and on Monday, I will send in week two when I have time. But anyways, let's get started. On day one in my wildlife journal, there is a whole host of critters. 
bears, wolves, mountain lions, eagles, foxes, badgers, squirrels, herds of deer, elk, bison, etc. All of these animals are in my five-year journal. Still, I have heard many stories about a creature called Bigfoot, but have yet to encounter one. But that night of that day, I think I might have heard, or maybe even potentially seen, a family of Bigfoot. There's nothing really special to recount about that, just like the deer and elk they were passing through on one of the game trails. My guess is the abundance of prey. The only thing special I observed was the alpha male looking like a silverback gorilla. Night 2 and in my journal, I wrote my observations of what I believed to be some sort of dogman. I overheard my uncle claim he shot one while protecting his sheep years ago. So I decided to check the sheep pen and followed a trail of blood to see that one of them had been dragged away. After following and tracking this monster, I almost gave up and headed to my deer stand to see if I could record any more wildlife. I managed to record a family of grouses and a few rabbits, and then I saw something that was very, very odd. It was like a deer, standing on two legs, but it looked wrong, like almost as if it were like a skeletal deer. But it smelled like absolute death. This was on night three, and was the most eventful thing that I think my family or myself have ever, ever experienced. This thing began to screech, run around our cabin, and make all sorts of noise all night. That smell never went away. Even after it was gone in the morning, that smell seemingly lingered for multiple hours. I don't know what was stalking us that night, but I am fairly sure it was a skimwalker. I'm sorry if the story is all over the place. I'm not a great writer, but I did want to try to recount as much information to you as possible.